ex Ndegwa to take us through the next stage. Um, thank you very much, Alan, and thank you everyone else for joining us. Um, this particular panel is really going to look at how the corporate um, tax practice has evolved over the last 10 years as more lawyers and more law firms take in um, um, tax briefs on both advice, the advisory side and the, and, and the litigation side. And on that, we, of course, are joined by a very distinguished panel that is very um, experienced in the sector, just to give us insights um, on those developments and on a lot of the developments that I've seen. Because I think if there's an area of the law where there are developments every single year is really in the, in the, in the tax area. And to moderate this particular session, we are joined by Rose Nyongesa, who is the manager at Strathmore Tax Research Center. She has over 12 years experience in tax law and practice both in the public and private sector. She was a member of the tax practice at DLA Piper Africa, IKM Advocates. And prior to that, she worked at KRA as a revenue officer in the large taxpayers office. She's also a member of the Law Society of Kenya Tax Committee. She's an advocate of the High Court and a member of the Association of Certified Chartered Accountants. And she holds a bachelor's of law, Bachelor of Laws degree from the University of Nairobi and a master's of law degree from the University of Amsterdam. Um, Rose, thank you so much for joining us. And you know, I'd like to yield the screen to you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction, Alex um, and Alan. And congratulations for a job very well done in this corporate law seminar. Um, we, the panelists, um, and I, and, and this is the only time I promise I will speak for them. We are very delighted to be part of this seminar. And I think it's extremely important to incorporate discussions on tax when discussing major corporate law. I may, be, I may be a bit biased in this opinion, but I have listened in on all the panel discussions from yesterday and, and tax came up at least three times with three different panels. And tax is a very big expense, even bigger when it's not handled correctly. And, and have been known to fall apart purely due to tax considerations. So with this in mind, um, we, we have brought together some excellent minds in the tax practice as, as Alex has alluded to, and I'm very honored and privileged to be moderating this panel of experts. Do a brief introduction of each one of them before we get into, into the panel discussions. Um, I will start with Daniel, Ngu Dan Daniel Ngumi. Um, he's a partner at Anjawala and Kana, and he heads the firm's tax department. He specializes in regional and international and has extensive experience in tax disputes and tax transactional matters. Daniel provides ongoing tax advice on matters affecting clients across various industries, including the financial sector, power, energy, and infrastructure, oil and gas, and FMCG, among he has advice on a variety of matters from debt and equity transactions to mergers and acquisitions. Um, Daniel currently chairs the Law Society um, Tax Committee and he's ranked by Chambers Global and Private Wealth, Wealth Law. Daniel is a qualified CPA. He holds a Bachelor of Law degree from the University of Nairobi and a postgraduate certificate in tax law and has a Master's of Law degree from the University of London. Welcome, Daniel. Um, the you. next panelist that I will introduce is Nihil. Nihil Hira is director in Bowman's Kenya and a member of the tax practice in Bowman's. He holds a formidable skill set, particularly in tax advisory work and tax dispute resolution, which he, honed, he has honed in East Africa, India, the UAE, and the, and the United Kingdom. He assists clients tax advice and tax dispute resolutions, um, working extensively with corporate MA projects and private equity practices in providing specialist tax services such as transfer pricing advice, tax amnesty applications, and so on. He's a well-known presenter and community tax and economic issues in East Africa. I can attest to that. He's a former council member of the Institute of Certified Public Accountants in Kenya, and he's also sat on the Tax and Public Finance and the Professional Standards Committee. Um, Nikhil holds a BSc with Joint Honours Accountancy and process engineering from the University of Salford, Manchester, England. Thank you, Nihil, and welcome. Um, last and last not least is Francis Kamau, who is a tax partner at Ernst & Young Kenya, and he leads the EY tax business in East Africa. He has over 17 years experience in tax advisory and is responsible for tax consultancy services for a diverse client portfolio, 
including banking, insurance, manufacturing, industrial, energy, telecommunication, and so on. Um, Francis is a member of the Parliament's Committee of Institute of Certified Public Accountants, ISPAC, and a founding member of ISPAC Center for Public Finance and Tax, Board of Directors. It is through ISPAC that Francis has played a key role in developing a draft income tax policy that, that was presented to the Cabinet Secretary of National Treasury. So thank you all for being here. Um, I think I'll jump straight to the questions. And I think the key theme has been about the evolution of tax um, of the corporate law in the last 10 years. So maybe that would be my first question for Nikhil. Could you just highlight for us how the legal, the legal tax practice has changed and evolved over the last decade? Over to you, Nikhil. Thank you, Rose. Um, I, I just want to stress, I'm not a lawyer, so uh, I, a bit difficult to talk about legal tax practice, but let me start by going back to the accounting world, which is where I came from. Um, and uh, many accounting firms, particularly the big fours around the world, had moved towards going from just a tax practice to a tax and legal practice. And uh, that, that we've seen some of, some of the bigger four firms <clears throat> here in Kenya do the same. And, and it is widening certainly across the continent and particularly in, in the developed world. Um, at, at the time, of course, the accounting firms saw no, no competition from all you lawyers. We, we pretty much uh, were a monopoly in, the, in that area. But over the years, and certainly while I was in practice, in the accounting practice, um, I, I saw more and more law firms uh, building up tax practices, not necessarily doing everything the accountants do in terms of compliance and uh, that sort of stuff, but certainly in the advisory, uh, going to the tribunals. And of course, we, we could never go to the, to the courts, but you could as lawyers. And, and that expansion meant that we as accountants were, were starting to see a different competition coming in. And, and I think that was the really four, five, six years ago, maybe the start of a legal tax practice where more and more uh, law firms were looking at having specialist tax practice in-house. Um, and perhaps Daniel, when he comments, will, will, he was one of the first, I think, in, 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 in that area as a, as a specialist tax practice. Um, and, and with that, uh, we saw a much wider base of tax practitioners uh, coming from both the accounting world and, and, and the legal world. And that um, has, to my mind at least, improved the sort of services that we're offering, the advisory, the research, that everything goes with it. Putting it sort of on a more personal level, having moved from the accounting world at, at a partner level to working in, 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 in the legal world, uh, I mean, I will say that the one thing that I immediately hit me was that the ability of lawyers to research and find case law was significantly better than us accountants. And I, I find that that, uh, when you start doing litigation or dispute resolution on tax matters, has certainly improved significantly over the years in Kenya and will no doubt continue to improve. Does that answer your question, Rose? Is that uh, so yes, yes, that does that does answer my question. Um, but maybe you could also talk about the evolution of the law, the tax law, a bit just over the last ten years. What do you think are, are the key things that have changed in the law and practice? So um, you know there has been changes, and yet there have been no changes. Uh, let's let's start with the, just the basic income tax. We are using the same law that we used back in 1973. We still use Income Tax Act Cap for 17, 1973. Um, as I often remark, the Income Tax Act in Kenya has more patches on it than Microsoft Office does. It, it's just constantly, we're just patching little bits and pieces on it. And it has become so complicated, uh, not, not through any design, simply because the patches don't necessarily follow a, a logical sequence that uh, you, you find that you, you're not sure whether you're reading the correct version. And, and I know a number of us now put together our own versions as we go along every year. Um, certainly we do that at Bowman's because, and I was doing that at Deloitte as well, uh, because you, you just don't know, you know what changes are coming and uh, 
who has, has patched it correctly, as it were. So income tax to me is ripe for a, for a reform. And of course, we've got the income tax bill 2018, which came out in 2018, became the income tax bill 2020. Uh, I have no idea when it'll become the Income Tax Act 2020 or 21 or 22, or whatever it's going to be, but uh, it is desperately needed because our law has just expanded with amendments every year that don't necessarily follow. Moving on to VAT, that we did see some reform back in 2013 with new law. Um, the whole idea was to move us away from a, a series of, of, uh, uh, of amend, uh, derating exempt exemptions in the law, which were really, um, you know, eroding the VAT base for the country. I mean, if you look at VAT, we've never ever in its whole history in Kenya, have we exceeded about 27, 28% of total revenues coming from VAT. And when you think that that's a consumption tax and all of us pay it when we, when we buy, there's no reason why we shouldn't be sitting at 30, 35, maybe even 40%. Many developed economies, that's what happens. So VAT Act 2013 was designed in the first instance to try and take out all those exemptions and zero rating and what have you. But lo and behold, eight years later, where we started with 30 exempt items, we've now got 120. And we started with 10 zero rated, we've now got 30. So we're back into that whole thing. And I think in 10 years time, we'll have to scrap this one and start again on that one. We've, we've reformed excise duty. We've brought in the Tax Procedures Act. We brought in the Tax Appeals Tribunal Act. All these things are, are steps in the right direction. Uh, they're helping to modernize our system, but we still do need um, a, a means to make sure that what is going into our law makes logical sense. Our tax policy has got to change. We cannot have tax policy which just looks 12 months ahead. And we've seen many of these where something comes in in year one, year two, somebody's realized, oh, well, that, that didn't make sense, so let's reverse it. We need to start looking medium to long term in terms of Kenya's tax policy. And I think that is where we are failing today. Thanks, Rose. Thank you. Um, it's interesting that you say that the policy appears to only look sort of 12 months ahead. Um, and I know today that there's a budget speech that's being read and, and a lot of reference will probably be made to um, the finance bill that was already released. Um, but over the last you know, 10 years, and maybe, maybe Daniel, you can you can you can handle this one. Over the last ten years, there has been some growth. At least, it's been argued that there's been some growth um, in in taxes in Kenya. We see those even um, KRA's sort of targets keep increasing every year. And I think that this growth in the tax practice has also led to the growth and development of the legal tax practice in Kenya. So, so what in the, in your view are the key contributors of this growth? Um, thank you very much, Rose. I think, first of all, there are very many things that Nikhil said that uh, I agreed with uh, entirely. Uh, I, could not, uh, I could not agree more, especially in respect of uh, some of his comments with, um, with the need for a consistent tax policy and the need to have a policy that is going to continually look into the future. We have seen quite often changes of the law um, that are done almost on the, on the fly where we see that you know, something is introduced in year one and the next day it's repealed, meaning that uh, more thought needs to be done from a long-term perspective. But, but just, uh, just, just, just sort of um, you know, turning to your question, uh, I think you know, we've seen um, a lot of complexity coming into the law. Um, when you think about the issues that uh, Nikhil has highlighted before, uh, we have seen you know, new laws coming into place. For example, the VAT Act was completely overhauled. We, we have seen you know, the tax procedure, uh, tax procedure Act. We've also seen you know, a number of appellate uh, statutes coming into place. Um, the Income Tax Act has continually become more complex. You know, there's a, the changes have been patchwork, as Nikhil had indicated before. And, and with complexity, the need for sophisticated advisors becomes even more apparent, <clears throat> um, especially given the fact, and I think we'll tackle this later on, uh, a number of new international law changes, primarily driven by the BEPS project, 
have uh, found their way into Kenyan law. So we now, we, have, we now have much more complexity when it comes to things to do with transfer pricing, which first appeared in Kenya's laws around 2005, 2006. We have uh, international law concepts such as permanent establishments, which are becoming, which are making, uh, you know, multinationals thinking about coming into Kenya need more sophisticated advisors. Uh, and as a consequence, what we are seeing over the, or what we have seen over the last ten years, is that um, <clears throat> you know the, the the days of of um, of you know someone getting a tax advisor who will only advise you on one angle of a transaction is less the case now. You know you need an advice, particularly when you're dealing with a multinational. You need advisors who will be able to give you a holistic approach on 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 the entire transaction from start to finish, and also understanding tax law in the context of global changes that are constantly changing. So, 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 so that together and coupled with the fact that the economy has been expanding has then led to the need for uh, services from lawyers. And I think in the old days, uh, most of the law firms were essentially much more geared to providing, uh, I'd say two types of legal services, conveyancing and litigation. You know, uh, when I was beginning my legal practice 10 years, I mean, uh, many years ago, uh, you know, about what we used to see 15 years ago was really just uh, those two practices. But, 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 but then, you know, tax laws have become more complicated. The economy is expanding. You have multinationals like Google and others who are looking to come to this part of the world. And as a consequence, you find that they need advice across a whole range of issues, intellectual property, uh, all sorts of uh, other legal areas, and tax has become one of the primary areas um, that needs to be thought through. Um, again, the other reason why uh, we have found that law firms are beginning to expand into the area of tax is because uh, disputes have also become increasingly um, high, high value. And uh, there was a time where um, the largest tax dispute you'd ever hear about was a 50 million demand from the revenue authority. Today we have seen demands which are in the range of, uh, you know, 30 billion, 40 billion Kenya shillings, and uh, and and it means that it is now a really high stakes, um, high stakes uh, game. If you get it wrong, or if you find that you have not structured your your, your transactions properly, um, the 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 kind of tax dispute that a business would get into is a significant one. Um, that is coupled with the fact that under the Tax Procedures Act, the Revenue Authority has increasingly obtained additional powers. So in the old days, uh, a demand would, would really result in a business being closed down. Now we are seeing instances where, you know, your bank accounts are frozen, um, the directors are charged, and as a consequence, it becomes a much more complex area that needs to be dealt with. In fact, um, when, when we advise boards of multinationals and significant corporates in Kenya, when they think about their top three risks that they need to deal with, Increasingly, we are finding tax being one of those top three risks that they need to deal with. So, so as a consequence, I think with all these issues, um, you know, we found that there is a, you know, an increased place for law firms to begin thinking about developing specific expertise. Um, as Nikhil mentioned, most law firms do not delve into the area of tax compliance, uh, but they do, they do increasingly look at uh, tax advisory work, um, advising on particularly international tax aspects when you're, in, when you're advising multinationals. And a big area that is increasingly growing is the tax controversy, which is really the area of dealing with disputes and especially because the disputes are becoming high and high in value and also, and also bigger high risk gains where the revenue authority will not only go after the company itself for the tax, but could also pierce the corporate veil and go after shareholders and directors. And that means that the need for getting, you know, more sophisticated and complicated advice has only become higher. So I think, uh, you, you know, you asked what has led to the growth and development of uh, the legal tax practice. I would say, Rose, that these are the key parameters, the, the, the sophistication of our market, the expansion of, um, of, of, of our economy and becoming larger, and, and just the fact that the revenue authority in itself has, has also become uh, much more aggressive and sophisticated in its approach. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I'll, I'll switch gears um, a bit. Um, you, you mentioned that expansion of the economy is one of the reasons why the tax practice has grown, but maybe if I can ask this, 
Um, with the expansion of the economy, of course, that means that more businesses will come into Kenya, especially multinationals. Um, and I want to know if, if um, in what ways, if any, is um, Kenya's corporate tax policy attractive for businesses? In your view, what measures do you think the government can take to make it more attractive or attractive if you think it is not attractive at the moment? I'm um, sorry, Francis, your voice is not quite. I don't know, is it just me? Can you all hear Francis? I think he may not be on computer or on the right audio. We can't hear you, Francis. I don't know if it's the connection. Francis, you probably need to unplug your headphones and do it the other way. Why don't we give Francis a few minutes? Francis will give you a few minutes to try and sort that out, if that's okay. Um, no, we still can't hear you. Yes, um, I'll, I'll sort of move on to the next question. So the, the question I was going to ask Francis was going to sort of um, move us into um, discussing sort of Kenya's um, tax policy and, 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 and my next question is going to be for Nihil. Um, I was going to, to bring up, well, I will now bring up um, an issue that's, that's become a hot topic and that's um, the question of minimum tax. Um, if you could briefly give us your view on what mischief the government is trying to solve in charging minimum tax and whether you think the charging of minimum tax will resolve this mischief. Uh, yeah, thanks, Rose. That, that's one that is dear to my heart. I actually think it's the most nonsensical piece of legislation that this government has put in. Uh, it, it, just, uh, it is just going to increase the cost of doing business in Kenya uh, at the expense of, uh, look, as I've always said, Kenya is not a little island on its own in the world. Uh, what we do here is done in other parts of the world as well. And an investor will sit there and say, well, where is it? Where am I going to get the most benefit? Where am I going to get the best returns? And if, uh, if where am I going to get the most incentives, etc." So if you're giving incentives as a result of which people are in tax losses, and then you say, well, no, give us 1% of your turnover, uh, you're, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul, and you're probably chasing away investors from the country. This minimum tax to me makes no sense at all. Uh, primarily because it, it, it is just, you know, just says turnover. It doesn't say whose turnover, how, where, you make some exemptions. You know, we saw one recently where the, where the cabinet secretary gazetted an exemption. So at what point do you stop gazetting in, in, in exemptions? You, you can't say that one taxpayer must pay minimum tax, but the other for certain reasons won't have to because the government has ex exempted it. Uh, so there's a question of fairness as well. What happens to uh, businesses that have high volumes and low margins, supermarkets, for example? Uh, the amount of tax they're paying uh, will never probably be the 1% of, of minimum tax, but they are actually being, um, they're actually being uh, compliant by submitting their taxes and, and paying tax uh, on the basis that was there. Secondly, we're talking about income tax here, not revenue tax and turnover tax. The, the principle of income tax or corporate tax is to say that uh, we are going to tax your net income. And yet, in the Income Tax Act, we've now introduced something that says, no, we'll tax your turnover instead. It, it just doesn't add up. Uh, what about those people that you have given an, an exemption to or an incentive to? You, you, know, you were getting 150% investment deduction allowance. Think about, about the big power projects that we have in the country. They're going to be in tax losses for a number of years, but they might be in accounting profits. And because they're in tax losses and not paying tax, which by the way, we, the government have given them, uh, you're saying, no, you just give us 1% of your turnover instead. 
there's no logic to it whatsoever. And, and I think, it, I mean, if there's one area that we should really lobby for everybody is to have this nonsense tax absolutely scrapped. It, it just doesn't fit in with us being a, a liberalized open economy where we're encouraging people to come and invest in the country. It, it's just wrong, I think. Sorry, I'm very emotional about that one. So. Yes, yes, I can, I can tell. But, but um, my understanding, at least, of, of the policy that Kerry was trying to you know, implement in charging a minimum tax was that they were targeting um, some of those companies which they did not have all these um, incentives like the capital expenditure and so on, were actually in consistent and constant loss-making position over a number of years. And so if, if, if I understand you correctly, is, is, is the position, should the position be that the government should specifically say, you know, this is who we are targeting and therefore this is a group of taxpayers that should pay minimum tax? Or your view is that it should entirely be done away with, even with the possibility of those companies that are just perpetually in a tax loss, even without the incentives? Look, um, I, I don't think it is correct to say that we are targeting a certain class of taxpayer. Uh, I mean, I think tax has to apply fairly to everybody. And, and indeed, even the constitution says that. Uh, this question of, com of companies that are perpetually in losses, and, and in my experience with KRA, they seem to think that all multinationals are effectively in that. Uh, now, we have transfer pricing law and transfer pricing regulations. KRA is free to come and uh, investigate audit, do whatever they want, and indeed they do. And it is possible, yes, I'm not saying no, it is possible that some of those losses are not really losses. They're simply us manipulating the transfer price to create a loss somewhere. But let's look at it from another perspective. Um, our corporation tax rate in the country is 30%. It's not necessarily a significant rate. Uh, yes, some parts of Europe and, and so forth have come below 20, but you know, you look around some other parts of the world, corporation tax rates are between 40, 45, even higher. So it, it's almost as though you know, people would want to shift profits into Kenya because we have a lower corporation tax rate. And it is the job of the revenue authority, to my mind, to enforce and go and check whether these companies are making losses because they're fudging their numbers or because they really are making losses. And at some point, of course, uh, if you're continuously making losses, and if you're a sane businessman, you will simply say, well, I'm closing up. And, and that's what should happen. And it does happen. So I, I, I don't agree with, let's distinguish a certain class of taxpayers. And as I said, we can't exempt some and not exempt others, because I don't think that's fair. Uh, and, and even when you look at the law, you know, we've, we've got... Uh, an exemption for insurance companies. We've got an exemption for uh, um, uh, the pet petroleum, uh, you know, at the pump stuff because of low margins. So, uh, you know, who does, I, I mean, I might have a low margin. <laughs> you know, lawyers might have a low margin. Should we be exempted? So, you know, with all this, I think uh, this is what I was saying earlier. Our policy is too short term. The 1% tax is purely designed because they think in the next 12 months, there's going to be a huge amount of that money coming in. And in, in relation to that, we have to understand that, yes, the country is in dire financial states. Borrowing is too high. Most of what we collect in the next 12 months, at probably as much as 50 to 60 percent, is going to service our debt, which doesn't leave much to run the country. So uh, the government, Treasury and KRA are looking for any source to get it. But you must have a source that is not going to chase your businesses away. Because if you do that, you're going to get no revenue at all. You're just killing the, the goose that's laying the golden egg. Thanks, Rose. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Rose, with your kind indulgence, can I also jump in on that question? Absolutely. Um, I, I think, you know, uh, the other reason why a lot of people have problems with minimum tax is that it will stifle um, startups. So we all know startups in the first three years or four years of their life would be loss making. 
And uh, if you're required to start paying taxes, even when you're in a loss-making position in the first year of operation, it obviously means that you know, uh, it demotivates you from making investment. Other countries such as Tanzania uh, only apply minimum tax if you have been in a loss-making position for at least three years. Same thing in Nigeria. Um, when you think about some of the other challenges that, um, that, that minimum tax brings, there are, there are businesses where from the entire beginning of the value chain, from the manufacturer till the, la the, the last consumer, they all share a, a margin of 1%, you know, being the difference between your total costs and your total uh, and your revenue. Now, if that 1% is what is going to be subjected to tax, it means that there are businesses that will make no sense going forward. And they're cyclical businesses as well. Businesses that only make profits, significant profits at one point in the year. Take the tourism sector. Most of them make their profits in December. Yeah. And uh, you're taxing them, uh, you will tax them a significant minimum tax for that one month in comparison to the other months of the year. So minimum tax is a big challenge. In fact, uh, our firm is representing Kenya Association of Manufacturers uh, before the High Court on this very issue, because we do think that it raises significant constitutional issues. And we think that it is important that the government reconsiders minimum tax and if at all possible, uh, they, 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 they change it or, you know, for the time being, take it away because it's quite problematic uh, and, and one that I don't think will benefit the country as a whole. Thank you, Daniel. Um, Francis, please say something so we can confirm that you hear us. Your technology is fixed. Oh, dear. We still can't hear you. No. <laughs> Okay, we'll give you some more time. When you're ready, please let us know so that we can allow you to join. Um, so with the question on minimum tax, I think, um, thank you, Daniel, for mentioning that, you know, minimum tax is being applied in, in other countries in the world. I know that there's a recent discussion about it with the G7, but um, and even with that discussion, um, maybe we can highlight, this is something that you brought up a bit earlier, highlight some of the international tax um, developments that have been ongoing in the past few years. Um, and we're gonna talk briefly about base erosion and profit shifting, what's um, in short referred to as BEPS. We just briefly, um, you know, simply as possible for all the people who are in the call that are not tax practitioners, just tell us what BEPS is and just maybe give us two or three examples of the ways in which it's implemented some of these BEPS initiatives. Okay, thank you, Rose. So, so um, base erosion is, um, is a scenario where profits are shifted to low or no tax jurisdictions. Um, I don't know how many people who are listening to us today have been following some of the conversations that are happening at the G7 level. But what is happening or what they're saying um, are two things. Um, the first one is that uh, a lot of the international corporates pay very little tax when you look at their global p and um, This company has significant operations in the US, in the UK, has significant operations in parts of Africa. But when you look at their global p and uh, because they're headquartered in a low tax jurisdiction, such as Gansi, Jersey, or the Channel Islands, or even Ireland, um, a lot of their taxes are channeled to Ireland. So the net sum of it is that um, they pay very low or almost insignificant taxes in the countries where they have the big operations. And a lot of their revenue is essentially paid uh, or, or ends up in that one jurisdiction, which is a low tax jurisdiction. Now, the conversation for BEPS, Biz Erosion and Profit Shifting, began, I think, when Obama was a new president. Um, his initial attack was really on Cayman Islands and those kind of places. But then the conversation broadened, it was picked up by the OECD and over the years has gained traction. Uh, there was a significant case, a Starbucks case, for those of you who may recall, where, which was one of the first cases that was being tested on, on, on how their revenues, uh, you know, it pays such, such low tax um, when it is actually a big, a big operation in the UK. And we have also seen recently, you know, other moves to attack um, the likes of Amazon and others along the same line. So, so the idea with the BEPS project was to come up with a number of action plans that was going to try and, um, and redistribute, if I may put it that way, 
uh, that tax that should be paid or the right, right amount of tax that should be paid by those entities. And, um, and as a consequence of BEPS, they came up with a number of action plans. And those actions uh, are actually 15 in, in number, are meant to essentially deal with a number of issues that were, were going to help or prevent the loss of revenue or tax revenue from the countries where these companies, multinationals in particular, have big operations and uh, shipping it to low tax uh, jurisdictions. So uh, as would be the case, a lot of developing countries embraced this issue. Kenya is one of the ones that has, um, has embraced it full heartedly. And when you look at our laws, in particular, starting from 2015 onwards, we have seen a number of steps that are being, uh, that they're trying to incorporate into our domestic tax legislation to deal with these sort of issues. Um, um, one highlight, for example, is action number six. Action number six deals with prevention of tax, tax treaty abuse. Now, um, a tax treaty abuse would easily occur or happen where, for example, someone has set up a company in Mauritius and uh, having set up a, a company in Mauritius uh, um, uh, uses his Mauritian company to lend to a Kenyan entity. And as a consequence of lending to the Kenyan entity, the, the interest that would be payable, uh, the tax that would be payable on interest is treated as if it is being paid to an unresident entity in a low tax jurisdiction, rather than um, one, to be, one being paid to, you know, domestically had he lent the money to Kenya. So by so doing, you end up reducing the tax rate effectively from 30% to 15. Now, that kind of measure uh, um, under action number six, um, Kenya introduced a provision in our domestic legislation that says, in order for you to benefit from a tax treaty, that company in the other country must be at least 50% owned by residents of that country. So in effect, even if today someone was to set up their own company in Mauritius or wherever else, they would not be able to benefit unless that company is in fact at least 50% owned by residents of that country. And it, it basically looks to the ultimate beneficial owner. So it is not possible for you to structure um, you know, around that um, by having a nominee, uh, just for argument's sake. Um, another change that, uh, that, or another measure that is uh, legislated for or has been um, uh, promulgated by the BEPS project is, uh, is enhancing the definition of permanent establishments. This is action number seven. Now, a uh, permanent establishment is an instance where a, foreign, a foreigner who comes to Kenya uh, for a period of time is deemed to have created an actual office or an actual presence in Kenya. Uh, in the old days, the test was very, was very uh, basic. This is prior to 2015. In 2015, uh, we overhauled the permanent establishment test. It was enhanced in our, in our domestic income tax act. And just now in the finance bill that has been uh, recently announced, uh, the permanent establishment test has actually even further been enhanced. It is now the case that a consultant who comes to Kenya for just 90 days could be deemed to have created a permanent establishment in Kenya. The consequence of that would mean that by virtue of creating a permanent establishment, um, that income is taxable in Kenya, um, which would otherwise not have been taxable um, had the person come to Kenya, left, come back to Kenya for a period of even six months before creating a permanent establishment. So, 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 so these are just examples. As I mentioned, there are 15, there are 15 action points. Um, and these 15 action points, each of them, in turn, the Kenyan government is trying to incorporate them into our domestic legislation. Maybe I can quickly mention action 13, which is country by country reporting. We have uh, recently seen it in the finance bill 2021 uh, being, being introduced by the finance bill. And what this means is that um, multinationals will be required now to basically strip and create PLs geographically. And that is then submitted to the revenue authority. So the revenue authority can see uh, on a geographical perspective, um, how much revenue each country is uh, generating and, uh, and therefore Kenya Revenue Authority can easily say, and also you're required to also report how many employees you have, the scale of your operations, among other things. So, so, so the idea with country by country reporting is to be able to say that uh, you should be matching your revenues or revenues should be matched against the size of your operation in that country. And it should essentially sort of help 
um, countries to, to bolster up their revenues. So I think on an overall perspective, uh, in, in many respects, um, BEPS uh, is aimed at helping, especially developing countries uh, from, from, from scenarios where profits are being shifted to another country. Um, Kenya has taken a number of measures to try and incorporate that. Uh, we, we, we are yet to see how effectively this project is going to work, particularly with the newer measures. For example, the country by country reporting, which has just been introduced in the Finance Bill 2021. Thank you, Rose. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I, think, I think I will just briefly summarize the three takeaways that I have um, coming out of BEPS is that one of the actions the government has taken is that um, if, if that in another country with which you have um, a treaty with Kenya, we need to be careful to advise our clients that it is not automatic that that company will get the treaty benefits. KRA will in fact look behind the owners of the company to make sure that they are in that country where that company is incorporated. So in your example, Mauritius, if a company that is earning income in Kenya, then it needs to be clear it needs to be clear um, that the treaty benefits for the Mauritian company only apply if, if the company's owners are resident in Mauritius. The other point you said is about the risk of creating a permanent establishment, that we need to be careful to advise our clients that if you have a consultant that is in Kenya for X amount, depending on the rules, um, then it is possible that um, that, that consultant's income will be fully taxed in Kenya, right? And then the rules on country by country reporting, which means more visibility of a, a company's global um, sort of relations. So now the Kenya Revenue Authority has a, a much clearer view and easier way to track how much income um, should be allocated to each jurisdiction for purposes of tax. Um, thank you very much. I think we will check on Francis again. Francis, if you're there, give us a shout. We're trying to sort out his technical issues. All right, that's fine, that's fine. No problem. Um, as, as we wait for Francis to, to sort that out, uh, as again, um, and this question is for Uni Hill. Um, you did mention that there's, there's a lot of uh, pressure from the KRA. So, um, and, and this pressure is coming from their need to raise revenues and so on. Um, the question here is that whether there's room for tax practitioners to build and manage relationships with the KRA um, and how can this, you know, building of relationships be done and is there room for collaboration with KRA? Um, the short answer to both your questions is yes. Uh, look, K KRA in, in a sense is like any other business. Uh, they, they, they just earn their money from what they collect. Um, and just as we earn our money from what we build and collect. Um, over my I don't know, now nearly 40 years of practicing tax in many parts of the world, uh, it is important to build a relationship with taxpayers, uh, with, with, with the tax authority. It is important to you know, understand them uh, you you may you may sit in a meeting and think God I hate these people, but the reality is that you know they're just like you are and uh, we we learn to to work together. I I've worked with many officers of the KRA over the years, um, and you just like lawyers and accountants, you're going to get the good ones and the bad ones. Um, you get good KRA officers, you get bad KRA officers, you know, it's, it's the same. But yes, you must have a good relationship with them. Um, my, I, I, my own philosophy, and this is purely a personal one, is that uh, you need to deal with the officer that is handling your client's matters. Uh, and you, you don't really want to, uh, unless it is, it is a real big issue that is happening that is not going anywhere, you don't want to overstep him and go to the commissioner or the deputy commissioners or, or whatever. You need to deal with it with the people who are on the ground because they really know what is going on. Uh, more often than not, the commissioner or, the, or, the, or the, the senior deputy commissioner, whatever it is, will not have that same detail as the guy who's on the ground doing the audit. Um, and, and 
if you build the relationship with them and, and you work together, at the end of the day, we, we're all paying tax because we want to live in a civilized society. The point is that we, we don't want to pay a penny more or a penny less than is actually due. Uh, KRA obviously wants us to pay the penny more. We want to pay the penny less. But at the end of the day, uh, there has to be that meeting point. And you only get that if you work with them in the same way that you work with your clients. And you've got to understand your clients' needs and business requirements and what have you in order to be able to advise them. And I think that's the same with, with, with the tax authority in a way. Thanks, Rose. Thank you, Thank you Nihil. Francis, um, please say something so we can confirm you with us. You can hear me now? Yes, perfect. <laughs> Sorry, I had the wrong correct connection. Thank you. No, it's fine. Um, maybe, maybe just to ease you into the conversation, you could give us um, your brief um, experience in building relationships with KRA and collaborating with KRA. Thank you very much. I've had uh, uh, quite an experience dealing with Kenya Revenue Authority. Maybe what I can do is to do a comparative analysis, a quick one. Uh, somebody mentioned that I'm in charge of the region, and that's the truth. I've dealt with various uh, um, revenue authorities. And for East Africa, I can basically mention Kenya Revenue Authority as of aggressive, extremely uh, of aggressive, so to speak. And the same, they are coming a bit higher than Tanzania. The other revenue authorities are able to understand. For example, uh, just to give you a simple, simple example, I've made a mistake and I paid some tax in error. So that tax I paid in error, uh, I was not supposed to pay KRA, I was supposed to pay KPLC, for example or any other particular example I can give on tax paid in error. Then you go to Kenya Revenue Authority, they take uh, six months to return the money to you or tell you to offset. For the other revenue authorities, you get your money within two weeks uh, as part of a region, uh, uh, you know, tax consultant. So I find that quite uh, unfortunate. Some of the other areas is that you have paid taxes and you have a, a tax receipt by Kenya Revenue Authority but they still want you to avail the original and they can see it in their system. I find that quite unfortunate. However, on the brighter side, um, in terms of uh, dealing with arbitration processes, uh, I think we are ahead of the pack. We have put measures of ensuring that the arbitration within Kenya Revenue Authority is smoother and is a bit well expanded and you're able to engage at the first team, the second team, the third team, uh, for the sake of our team, I don't want to get a bit complex on that. But I think uh, dispute resolution, uh, that is an area can the revenue already have worked uh, extremely well. Uh, the other particular part is uh, digitization and the digital platforms are good for Kenya revenue authority. Those are, those are some of the areas uh, you can be able to look at. Maybe just to introduce myself to the conversation. Thank you, Rose. Thank you, Francis. Um, and and you, you've actually brought up the topic that I was going to discuss next, which is dispute, tax dispute resolution. Um, and this, this question, I think I will direct it at Daniel. This is the, he's the lawyer in the, in, in, in the group. The group. Um, um, Daniel, maybe you could tell us, uh, you, you could describe your experience in dispute resolution over the last 10 years. You know, how has it evolved? And what are your thoughts on the future of the tax dispute resolution? Um, thank you, Rose. So I think I think it's uh, it's it's a uh, it's it's evolving quite a lot. I think maybe four or five years ago, in most instances, uh, there were there were very few mechanisms of trying to resolve a matter. Uh, if, for example, you went into if a dispute arose, and it went into the tax appeals tribunal you have to see through the process, through the tax appeals tribunal, all the way to the high court and get a determination. And I remember that uh, back in 2009, there's a matter that we began, which went to the high court. And by the time it was being had, I think it was finally determined in 2020. So 11 years later, because you know the process was very long, very tedious, it was difficult to try and get a quick resolution. Now, this has the downside of number one, most boards would have to provide for this claim. So you're carrying a liability on your balance sheet, uh, having provided for it. Second thing is that uh, there's a lot of time that is lost for management in terms of resolving the matter. And it makes it difficult for them to engage in day-to-day -day activities because they sort of feel that they have uh, 
Damocles sword hanging over their heads, which may one day come and, uh, and, and chop them off together with a company. So, so obviously um, what we have seen is that I think in 2000, about, about maybe three, four years ago, the Revenue Authority, first of all, set up what they're calling the Corporate Alternative Dispute Resolution Team. Uh, and, uh, in, and, and what we have seen is that that has helped because there's now a formal way when you're in the middle of this dispute before the tax appeals tribunal, before the high court or whatever the case may be, take out the matter, take it to the ADR team, see whether you can resolve the matter. Sometimes you, 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 it's difficult to resolve the entire issue, but what we are increasingly seeing is that if for example, it's a multifaceted demand from the revenue authority with maybe seven or eight different components, you know, you can try through the ADR process to resolve one or two of them and then leave the, leave the ones that are incapable of being resolved through ADR for determination by the tax appeals tribunal or the high court as the case may be. That is helping a lot in terms of finding a way or a route of resolving that matter. Um, the second thing that we have seen is that the, 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 the tax appeals tribunal has actually become extremely robust. Now, um, we, we, between Nikhil and Francis and myself, I'm sure we have uh, pros and cons of how robust they have become and whether it's the right thing or not. Uh, but you know, we are seeing that um, they, they're trying to close matters from the time you file the case till the time you get a determination. Uh, you, it's, they're trying to, re, to reduce that as much as possible. I think they're trying to do it in 90 days. 90 days is almost impossible. But six to 12 months, we're seeing judgments coming from the tax appeals tribunal. Of course, there are many issues with the process because sometimes when you go for the hearings, you know, your, your submission is limited to five minutes, which I think is impractical. Uh, but the reality of the matter is that, um, is that you know, we are seeing that the tax appeals tribunal has become much more robust in terms of being able to deal with those issues. And that in itself is helpful in terms of getting a quick resolution and closing out the tax matters. Let them go to the next level, but quickly, you know, get over that process. Um, one other thing that has recently happened is that the Kenya Revenue Authority has introduced what they're calling the Independent Review, Review Office, IRO. Now, the IRO is that, you know, for, for those of you who are familiar with the dispute process, is that um, a dispute begins by an assessment that is raised by the Revenue Authority, and then the taxpayer objects to that, to that uh, assessment. And in the old days, uh, you know, the same team that has raised the uh, assessment would, would be required to, to reassess and, and confirm before you get into the, into the next level. But now they have created what they're calling an independent review office. So, so the moment the objection is raised, it then goes to the IRO for the IRO to reconsider the facts afresh. Now that gives the taxpayer an opportunity to make an argument that had not previously been made or to try and correct the views of the revenue authority. And in my experience, I'm seeing some mixed outcomes. In certain instances, very positive outcomes um, where you actually find that the revenue authority will reconsider afresh and drop off certain issues. Uh, and therefore what you get by way of a confirmed assessment, which then goes to the tax appeals tribunal is, uh, is, is a sort of a cleaner version, not in every case, but in certain instances, we are seeing that outcome. So the, the issue of trying to resolve matters can be done uh, in two ways. You know, amicable, through some sort of amicable settlement where possible, through the ADR process and you enter into an ADR agreement, which then closes that issue. And, uh, or otherwise through a sort of an accelerated, increasingly accelerated process, where you go to the tax appeals tribunal, the matter is heard, and then the matter then goes to the high court uh, beyond that. So, so, so that is sort of, I think it's, it's, it's helping now because the amount of time that management is spending or an instance like I, I explained where we had a matter that started in 2009 was only being had in um, you know, last year. I think those sort of instances will probably diminish uh, over time. I'm sure Nikhil and Francis can weigh in on this issue as well. Um, if either of you would like to add anything, that would be welcome. Yeah, I, I certainly think that uh, the whole dispute resolution mechanism has improved a lot over the years, certainly the last two, three, four years. Uh, we had a, a little period in the middle when there was no tribunal and cases once again got backlogged. Um, I, I, I do feel though that um, uh, 
because of the backlogs that they have, uh, you know, so there's a possibility that cases are being pushed through a lot quicker without the chance for someone to def defend themselves or put their arguments forward. You know, we're relying more on now submissions rather than uh, someone sitting there and saying, well, let's go through this and understand what the, the dispute really is. Uh, that's, I mean, that's certainly sp speeding up the whole process. Um, and, uh, you know, the idea of the independent review office uh, is good. I I've had two or three things from them. Uh, you know, like anything, some are good, some are bad, but uh, it's, it's, I think, a good step forward. And I, and I think um, as, as a whole dispute resolution, at least up to the tribunal level, level I, I can't speak at the court levels, but at the tribunal levels has certainly improved a lot in the last two, three, four years. I don't know if Francis would agree, but. Thank you, and Gail and uh, Daniel, I think uh, you are spot on on all areas. I just want maybe to mention one of the good areas um, in terms of cl close out of issues. Previously, we used to have an auditor that was running and running and running. We had one for an airline, which I'm not going to name, from 2001 to 2015. Still, the issues were still open. I don't know whether they were closed. I don't know whether it's Daniel who took over that case, but they are now closing out issues effectively. And uh, of course, you'll have some few of them which will be falling by the wayside. But I just want to weigh in one issue which maybe was not mentioned. In terms of respect of rule of law, with uh, Daniel on the call, uh, with some of the areas you see, somebody can wake up in the morning and get you an assessment. Within a moment, they give you seven days. Uh, an agency notice is issued. At the same time, you find yourself your account frozen. That is a legal matter from where I'm seated. And I think as we discuss, uh, because I work very, very closely with lawyers, we have, um, I don't know what the lawyers call it, uh, going to issue uh, an order of saturation and with the Mademas, uh, maybe that's basically what uh, we have been trying to do. But at the same time, there's an airline, I'm sorry to talk about airlines, but it's an airline. Once you close, I mean, or freeze the accounts for three days, you have completely missed that particular business. So the areas, the small areas which we are saying, we are seeing uh, total disregard of the rule of law uh, and acting outside uh, what the law requires, I think they are costing business uh, quite uh, so much. And again, for the two countries as a regional tax expert, Kenya and Tanzania need to review that. They are going to drive away investors by those areas which are not getting very, very clearly in terms of this business. Back to you, Rosie. Thank you, Francis. But um, as, as an aside to that, um, there was a mention yesterday to the future of tax dispute resolution. There was a mention um, during one of the panels of the possibility of having a specialized just that deals with only tax disputes. Um, do you think we are ready for that? Do you think the tax appeals tribunal is enough and we don't need a specialized bench? Um, what are your views? Maybe, maybe Daniel can take this one. Yeah, so, uh, you know, we have what, what the, a division in the High Court known as tax and commercial. And uh, what we're beginning to see is that there are certain judges who increasingly deal with tax cases. Yeah, initially it was a lot of judicial review. Uh, that's the term that Francis was looking for. Uh, a lot of judicial review cases. But, uh, but increasingly appeals emanating from the tax appeals tribunal. Now, I think the challenge we find, um, and, and on this I'll be quite, quite, uh, quite forthright, uh, we find two challenges with the High Court. The first one is that uh, certain judges are rotated too often. So when you think about the, the, the High Court in Nairobi, someone who, even when he was beginning to develop capacity for dealing with tax cases, no sooner have they begun doing so, you hear that the same judge has been moved either to Machakos or to Kisumu or wherever. So, so then you, you, you begin lacking that center of excellence, you know, where you develop the capacity. And this judge has basically begun understanding, you know, tax principles and the likes, because a lot of investment is required, you know, to, to read the tax statutes, to understand them in detail. And I think the second challenge we have is that for a long time, practitioners at least legal practitioners, 
who had sort of specialized and uh, had emphasis in tax were few. So in Kenya, uh, by the way, when you look at, for example, the employment uh, division of the high court, there are very many practitioners. When you think about environmental law, you also find that there is no shortage of, um, of, of uh, practitioners, particularly because environmental law also deals with land. So you have you know, uh, hundreds of conveyances who have been there. But if you're, if you're trying to look for someone who has a, either a corporate commercial background or a tax background uh, in the high court, those people are few. And maybe this is a challenge also for the people who are listening to us today, uh, especially those in Strathmore University, that there is a clear gap in terms of finding lawyers who will one day progress into the, into the courts of law and will be specialists in tax matters. And I think we need that because the, the kind of disputes we are now seeing today are, are extremely sophisticated and complex. And unless we develop that capacity, uh, it is difficult for us to see um, how some of these cases will be determined. So, so very recently, there was, a, there, was a, there was a very big case involving uh, taxation of card transactions, you know, the, the credit card transactions. And, and the principles that were being canvassed before the Court of Appeal, because that is where the decision was made, um, I am sorry to say that there were very, uh, you know, very detailed and very sort of sophisticated issues that unless someone has had the experience of Nikhil or uh, Francis in the tax world, some of these things will be extremely challenging for, for, for to be determined by, by a panel that generally looks at other issues. So I do think that there is a need to create tax capacity. We need tax courts. We need them at every level. Uh, I think we are seeing now the tax appeals tribunal looking for the right caliber because we know that there are people there who have experience in tax matters. I think the trick now for the new chief justice is to consider how that kind of caliber and expertise could then transcend the levels from not just the tax appeals tribunal to the high court, to the court of appeal. And we hope in the years to come even in the Supreme Court um, so that they, there is an ability to, to deal with tax issues uh, in, in the manner that they, they, they deserve to be dealt with. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I'll backtrack a bit so that I can give Francis um, some time to speak so that he can catch up with the time that was spent with that by the other speakers. His technology was giving him issues. So um, we've been discussing disputes and, and you know, the, the biggest liability I think for a business can be, can be a huge you know, tax liability from, from the Kenya Revenue Authority from an audit or even any other tax liability. So, so maybe you could give us from your experience two, two or three examples on how businesses operating in Kenya can mitigate their tax liability exposure. Francis? Thank you for that. And uh, some of the areas maybe which can uh, be involved in terms of mitigating, one of them is to assure, ensure that at least you have a deep understanding of the tax law in this country. And when I say tax law, it should also be quite broad to understand that uh, this is also part of practice. Uh, so that is one of the, the, the areas which maybe I can talk about in terms of arming yourself. And in arming yourself in that particular direction, you really have to attend internal training and of course, tax essentialization programs so that you understand the whole aspect of it. What we see, Rose, where I'm seated, if somebody is coming from Portugal and they want to apply the tax law in Portugal, in Kenya, you really need to understand about the local tax regimes. The other area is to keep up with the tax law changes. Again, uh, maybe later on I'll get a chance to talk about the tax policy, but I think Nikio and, um, and Gomi have really talked about the shifting goalposts from a tax perspective. But at one particular time, we had a tax law which had a shelf life of 19 days, uh, around 2018. And I was presenting it to come the other day and they were laughing and I was telling them, yes, it had a shelf life of 19 days. So you really have to follow what is happening today. The other particular issue you have to do is to work very closely. And um, I'm, I'm not selfish here. I'll start with lawyers. You really have to have a tax lawyer. You need to have a tax accountant or one of them. So if you're a big corporation, you require Angumi and a Francis come out to guide you through the processes so that again, you have to ensure that each and every nook and cranny around taxation 
is picked. And even bigger corporation, you need to outsource actually um, the, the, the tax uh, you know, work that is there or have an internal tax resource. And in fact, you can even go and borrow one of the staff from Nikio or to um, Francis Kamau from Gumi, and you basically outsource them to work with, together with the internal teams. The other particular issue which should be there is to ensure that uh, you are able to capture all the communication from Kenya Revenue Authority. Some of them, uh, I see accountants, uh, Rose and team, where they get a letter and they think is a love letter from Kenya Revenue Authority. There's no love, ladies and gentlemen. That letter, don't keep it in your desk. It can cost the company. Lastly, I know I have so much to talk about. I'll just basically summarize that you need the whole aspect of tax planning within yourself. And one of the areas we have seen those uh, is the fact that some people just wake up from nowhere and then they can dive headlong to sign contracts without involving the tax consultant and the tax lawyers to review those contracts. And whenever you have a major business operation like restructuring and all that, kindly come together and involve uh, somebody who understands about reviewing those contracts. There are so many much I can discuss, but I think that one is enough for now. Thank you. If, if, sorry, Rose, if I could just add there, I, I mean, I totally agree with Francis. The most exasperating clients are the ones who will do the transaction and then get into a mess and say, please sort out for me. By then it's too late. So you, you can't you. sort out once the transaction has been done. So yeah, you need to plan in advance, I think. Thank you, Nihil and Francis. I think the take home here is that even when you're doing the contract, the pre-advice that you give your client, you have to involve your tax team. You have to think about tax consideration at that point, because it's important to determine how you go ahead with that transaction. Um, I think I'll change gears again. Um, I'm going to discuss the changes, the previous changes that were pro pro proposed in the finance bill. Um, we're going to be highlighted again today at um, during the budget speech, if that's not already going on. But there's just one that, that kept coming up in, in discussions that I've had um, it's about the change in the definition of control that's being proposed by the finance bill. Maybe uh, Francis again, you could you could probably discuss this definition of control and elaborate how this this new definition is likely to affect um, multinationals, especially, but also other businesses that deal with multinationals in general. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rose, for that. And what has happened is that. Uh, we had a paragraph 32, second schedule, which defined control. And the whole gist of that particular control was 25% of the voting power of a company. If you are an outside entity who had 25% and above, just to put it into perspective uh, for small business purposes, then you are seen to control that particular entity. And the control had a number of areas. It had a number of areas from a thin capitalization perspective, and it also had a number of areas from transfer pricing, among other areas, in terms of determining. For example, if you control a company, of course, which basically uh, from outside Kenya and which you basically had the threshold of 25 and above or any other particular aspect of control which was there, and the debt to equity ratio was three is to one, then we said you are then capitalized. And what was happening for that is that interest should be disallowed at the same time when you come to. Uh, the exit losses again. Uh, there was an issue of uh, disallowing from the tax computation. Now, current minister of what we call the CS, he has decided to change the definition of this animal code control, and it is all over the place. One of the areas is that uh, the shareholding is now 20%. In the case you have a guarantee, then at 70%, there is control. Again, even if you are supplying a certain company, 90% of the supplies you are seen to be uh, controlling that company. So these are whole myriad of parameters to determine control, which basically uh, assume I'm looking as an entity, uh, like uh, for example, Taskis. So you have to go down and think, do we have any supplier who is applying 90%? Do we have any guarantee which is 70%? Just name of that few. But having said that, the, the, the other particular onerous thing that has happened is that that is not only way you can be able to determine control. The commissioner has also been given discretionary powers uh, that you, they can deem control. 
So you can you might have even below a guarantee is below 70. You can have uh, you might not have a supplier who is minority and shareholding, but he can look for other means to deem that you are controlling that particular company. So it leaves it open ended. So what am I talking about here? I remember my friend Daniel talked about the entire issue of complexity. So this law, instead of uh, from the canons of taxations of simplicity, it makes the law very, very uh, uncertain and complex, so to speak. And um, from that particular perspective, is it going to affect the transfer pricing? May, uh, yes, it is going to, because uh, we have now to shift goalposts on how to determine what we can call the post, uh, transfer pricing perspective in terms of determining control. Will it affect the capitalization? Uh, then that is another story because even the uh, thin capitalization story has changed. And when you look at the provisions of uh, the law, uh, you'd basically see that uh, uh, it was three to one, where debt to equity ratio it was three to one for you to be deemed to be thinly capitalized. Now we are talking about a percentage of uh, your earnings before interest tax and um, uh, in, in interest. Um, and depreciation and amortization. So basically when you're looking at that, that uh, when you're looking at uh, the percentages, they are talk, talking about that particular of determining the bid capitalization, this one might not so much affect the bid capitalization because the determination of uh, the capitalization has basically changed. So what I'm looking at this particular uh, area is that all the clauses which are affected by the word or the determination of the control, we have uncertainty, we have complexity, and again, we have a commissioner, commissioner's discretion to determine the control. So most likely, let's talk about now Kenya Revenue Authority. I said Kenya Revenue Authority is a body which uh, sometimes goes out of the way to look at the negative part of it. When you give them discretionary powers, they can determine anything, they can deem anything uh, which comes to their understanding, they can write a paper and say to us, again, because you have been given a discretion by the law, these are other parameters that we'll be considering. And one of the areas they might be considering, most likely, is uh, a person who basically uh, has a certain threshold in terms of uh, uh, running the company. So they can come and see this particular person has a certain level of control, so they come have determinants about that particular person. Uh, he might be indirectly having discussions within the company. For example, we have a certain bank which has a very strong, we have very strong CEOs, you know them. So there's a discussion that they can go through that discussion in terms of the discretion, but allow maybe my team to weigh on uh, this particular issue. I might have left one thing or the other in terms of determination. Thank you, Francis. Um, Daniel uh, Ornihil, either one of you, maybe you could just highlight briefly further on, on the effects of this of this new definition of control um, to the operations of Dani. I, I mean, I think uh, Francis has captured it quite uh, succinctly. Um, I think the thing that I find most troubling in that new definition is the point that um, control could be could be created or deemed even from a loan relationship. So for example, if I have lent you money um, and, um, and that debt is, uh, is a significant debt, that could be defined to mean control. Um, and, uh, and also the power of the commissioner to actually determine what control means. Now, what this means is that it affects uh, a whole range of issues. The most, uh, one of the most complex areas being transfer pricing. Because you know, whereas parties are, are free to negotiate, willing buyer, willing seller, the fact that you now have to be thinking about who is a con who is a related party by virtue of the new definition of control, and begin thinking as to whether you want to keep transfer pricing documentation, even where there is no ownership link, purely from a definition of control, I think that could be quite problematic. Now, granted, the Kenya Revenue Authority is trying to develop or to find. You know, to try and close loopholes. But I do think that this definition has gone a bit too far and the room for mischief uh, from, a, from an officer of KRA when raising an assessment 
now becomes a much greater risk. So, so I, I, I think, um, you know, the, the, the need to rethink this definition is, um, is key. Uh, we may need to consider it very carefully because the number of disputes that might emanate from it might become quite high in the days to come. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah. So, Rose, I, I mean, I think uh, this and uh, some of the other definitions that have been introduced in the finance bill are, you know, we're using a sledgehammer to crack a nut. Uh, it, it, it just becomes so wide that effectively anyone can control anyone uh, with, that, with the definitions they've got in there. And I, I think what Daniel and Francis are saying, that this, this is definitely uh, an area where uh, you're going to find a lot of disputes arising, particularly in the area of, you know, you deem someone to control. Uh, I mean, that's pretty much a subjective thing to say. So I, I can see that uh, what we're doing is, is sort of widening definitions, widening the law in such a way that we're just trying to catch anything even if it shouldn't be caught anyway. And uh, it, it's all part and parcel of this, almost what I was saying earlier, this almost desperation to collect tax revenues to get the country out of a financial crunch. Uh, but that financial crunch is of our own making. Uh, it's, it, sorry, it's, it's the government's making, it's not the taxpayer's making. And, and it's rather unfortunate that the taxpayer who already feels overtaxed is, is going to get you know, hit more by, by definitions that are so wide that really they have no meaning in a sense. Uh, and, and I think that's a worry. And, and that's part of our tax policy that I think is going wrong as well. Okay, thank you, Neil. Uh, I'm trying to ensure that we finish by our allocated time of 3 p.m. So um, with your, your guidance, Alan, I think I'll just jump straight to the questions so that we can handle this before time runs out because we have 14 minutes left. Um, that's okay. That's okay. Um, I can see most of the questions from the chat have been handled by Nikhil. Well, it was one question. We have one open question. Um, which I can read out, then can decide who will answer. This is from Brian Sabari. I'd love to hear the panelists' comments on the proposed changing of exported services from being zero rated to exempt and the possible effect it will have on local investment and service delivery, especially during this recovery period, should the bill go through. Hmm. I, think, I think I'll have Nikhil answer that question. <laughs> It's another case of increasing the cost of doing business in Kenya. I mean, that's what's going to happen. Um, look, let's let's put a, a sort of example to it, and let's talk legal for the moment. Uh, a law firm that is advising somebody in the UK who wants to invest into Kenya. Um, under the current law before the finance bill, uh, to me, those services were for use or consumption in the UK in order for that person to make a decision as to whether he wants to invest into Kenya. Uh, and therefore we zero rated. So by zero rating, of course, we can claim our input taxes back. Uh, moving it to exempt has actually made the cost, our costs, law firms or accountants, whoever we happen to be, or marketing firms, you know, the, the big uh, multinationals who have their marketing firms in, 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 in country, uh, by making it exempt, they can't claim their input tax back. And therefore, we've suddenly increased everybody's costs overnight. Uh, now, you can look at the other side of the coin and say, well, you know, what's the logic to this? Well, the logic is that if it was continued to be zero rated, there were a lot of people who were in tax in VAT refunds, which, as we all know, uh, Treasury and KRA have been struggling to keep up with and, and, and deal with effectively. So by making it exempt, we've suddenly dropped out a whole load of refund claims that, that, that perhaps were being made. Uh, but what you have done, and this, must be, this may be the unintended consequence, is that you have increased the cost of doing business in Kenya. And as I said when we, in your first question, Rose, to me, that uh, 
we have to remember that there are plenty of places in the world where people can go and invest. And if we make it too expensive to invest in Kenya, people will just move out. And, and while tax is not necessarily very high on the list of, of essentials that, that, that people look at when they're coming to invest in the country, it certainly plays a big role. But if the tax is there and the cost of doing business is going up as a result of the policy and, and the legislation, then I think we stand to lose out in the long term. And I think export of services is one such thing. Thank you, Nihil. Um, I think on that question, I have had um, a different school of thought who seem to believe that, you know, because um, the VAT Act failed to define what an exported services is and because of the increase, it's about the same matter, then they decided that the way to deal with it was to, you know, make it an exported service so that um, the issue of refunds doesn't have to come in. But I don't know, that, that, was, that view was not entirely supported, but Maybe that's one way of considering the reason for that. But, but uh, Rose, the, the, to me, the, the, uh, the definition of an export of service in, in the VAT Act is one uh, for which use or consumption is outside Kenya. Yes, it's it's, it's the entirely the, the OECD's destination principle. It is not, be, it's, VAT is a domestic tax. So if you are not using or consuming that service or the goods that you buy in Kenya, then VAT in Kenya should not apply. Uh, I, I mean, you could be in this scenario where, uh, let me just give a brief example. You have an overseas company that contracts to do a project in Kenya, but it, it doesn't want to, um, it, it doesn't want to set up in Kenya. So it, it'll supply the equipment, but it'll have a, a branch or something that will do the installation for that project. Uh, if you look at that, you can end up with VAT three times on the same transaction. Because on an installation, uh, when, when the, the Kenyan branch builds uh, the, the, the overseas company, that company may have a reverse charge liability. When that company builds its ultimate client, there's another reverse charge liability. Uh, and then you're saying because, and, and this is not quite export services, but you're saying because the service is used or consumed in Kenya, that the branch has to charge VAT to, 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 the, to the parent. So that same transaction is going through three sets of VAT. And that to me can never have been what the intention was. And I don't know if Francis or Daniel have different views on that, but I've always thought that it is uh, uh, excessive taxation on the same trans transaction. Thank you. Just, just to comment, um, and I agree with Michael what he said about it. Um, it's just also looking at the business perspective. Most of us, I mean, we got jobs and uh, we started working by local companies uh, for uh, our livelihood. Our youths are all over the network. Some of them, uh, when they leave school, they go and get a four bedroom house for everybody in their own rooms, and then they're using the same house to do a lot of activities out there. Uh, some of them are marking examinations, some of them, and they get a lot of money. So we have a lot of uh, uh, those activities happening in this particular country, especially for our youths. And most likely the consumption of those, um, maybe I can, I, I can I, it is an argument whether those ones are consumed outside the country. But when you come and uh, basically cross all that and you want to tax, some of those, including um, when you're looking at uh, what the country is trying to develop, business uh, uh, processing or outsourcing of shoring services. We have entities which basically are creating all that. And when you're looking at uh, uh, Kenya as a destination, that is what we can be trying to yank off from Indians. Once you start taxing some of those and imputing VAT on that, the Indians, Sri Lankans and all that, they already have put their act together and you want to make a quick buck out of those by ensuring that uh, you tax all those particular activities which are happening, including the offshoring activities. It is very difficult for us to grow as an economy. And I think it's something they think to think. And of course, uh, we have other means of collecting taxes other than this particular process we are discussing. Thank you. 
Thank you, thank you, uh, panelists, for that. Uh, we have another question from Garan. Uh, question to Daniel: What is your take on the Court of Appeal judgment on interchange fees, especially to the extent it creates a relationship between the acquiring bank and the issuing bank, where there exists none? Uh, you know, I usually restrain myself from speaking about uh, matters that we we saw sort of involved in, but uh, but I can give a view. Um, basically, um, the matter has been, I don't know how much you know about the case, but there was a decision from the Court of Appeal recently uh, on the question of interchange fees. Interchange fees is where essentially you use a credit card. And when you use a credit card, uh, you know, there are a number of banks who are involved. You have an acquiring bank, you have an issuing bank. The issuing bank is the bank that has given you the card. Uh, and you have a card company in between. And, um, and, and of course you have the, the merchant. So in that, in that sort of transaction, there are a number of fees and a number of charges that are passed through uh, between the time that you buy the asset and the time that um, you know, the bank funds you for this particular asset. Now, my, my personal view uh, is that um, that court of appeal decision, um, there were certain aspects that were probably not very well considered, which is part of the reason why I do think that there is a strong case. And I certainly hope that leave will be granted by the Court of Appeal for the matter to go to the Supreme Court because that is where the matter currently lies. And I know that if it goes to the Supreme Court, a number of people will become enjoined um, for purposes of trying to, to see whether the matter can be once more canvassed. But meanwhile, we are seeing a number of cases that have gone to the Tax Appeals Tribunal. We're seeing a number of judgments emanating from the Tax Appeals Tribunal. I think the matters that were being challenged before the Court of Appeal covered uh, a number of aspects. There was withholding tax on the interchange fees and there was also VAT. And I do think that the VAT is, uh, is, is increasingly becoming apparent. Uh, for instance, I saw a decision uh, emanating from the Tax Appeals Tribunal last month where the tax appeals tribunal was very clear that, um, that you know, the entire transaction and the interchange fee uh, falls squarely under the definition of financial services and is therefore exempt. And I do think that that is the right decision uh, from a VAT perspective. The question is whether when the matter goes to the Supreme Court or if indeed it goes to the Supreme Court, um, the, the, the question as to whether withholding tax or interchange fees can be reversed. Um, if it is not reversed, then uh, in the same way we have just discussed the question to do with exported services, uh, we can be certain that that cost will be passed on to, to consumers to the detriment of a country as a whole. And secondly, I do think that uh, it will, we will find that Kenya is in odds with our neighbors and generally with, uh, with, with the rest of the uh, African continent. Because what we should be doing is to try and reduce as much as possible friction on transactions. I remember there's a time when for every transaction you could swipe with a credit card, it cost you two or three percent of the value of the goods that you are buying. I think what we should be trying to do is the opposite, um, to make that uh, as seamless as possible so that the cost of using, you know, the ability to use credit cards when you go to buy can, can be enhanced rather than reduced. Uh, and especially because we're moving to a digital economy where we will increasingly see sales being done electronically and uh, credit cards will be primary to that sort of process. So I do think that um, um, if, if, if there's an opportunity for this matter to be had, it will certainly be good uh, by the Supreme Court so that we can see whether a different outcome can, be, can, can arise but, uh, but, but granted, I think that there's a strong appealable case and hopefully, uh, you know, um, this is going to be dealt with in the, in the days to come. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so we have a final question from Carol Gishina. Um, I'll try merge it with the one from Silas. Um, so Carol asks, what is your view on the voluntary tax disclosure program by KRA? What are the potential risks and gain for a taxpayer? Um, I'm sure you've all received an email on that. Then the one from Silas is that minimum tax seems to overlap with other tax regime, regimes such as enrollment tax, turnover tax, etc. Please advise if this is the case. 
Also, in your view, does the minimum tax offend the charge in clause in the Income Tax Act? So I think those can be the closing, closing questions. Maybe I can address the voluntary tax disclosure program. Yes, please. And, uh, one of the things which um, makes me uh, quite worried is what I was talking about, Kenya Revenue Authority going against the law. Because voluntary tax disclosure program is a tax amnesty. A tax amnesty we have done in based, uh, on a first platform whereby the first year, if you do it, you are given all your problems and penalties and interest. And the second year, again, that one continue reducing up to the third year. But come to Kenya Revenue Authority, to dive to the question, comes and start issuing letters that you need to apply for voluntary tax disclosure by this particular date. Again, it's the provisions of the law. Again, it's what has been uh, discussed at various levels from a, a legal perspective, from a tax disposition perspective, and those particular letters have received some of them. So my question is, why does KRA do these things by providing you know, other particular documents outside the framework of voluntary tax disclosure program? So that is one of the problem I see, the, the, the interest of Kenya Revenue Authority coming out against what was a determined under voluntary tax disclosure program. The other particular problem I foresee is uh, the time to complete this. For example, you're saying the first, the first year, you are actually forgiven all your penalties and interest. Now, if you file, is KRA going to complete that? And what are we going to see if they don't complete and it actually, the process continues to the second year. So again, because of the Vazilas of officers we have talked about, I see another problem there. So we need to have a framework of trying to say that if you basically file by that year, of, by that 1st of December, 2021, then you are within the application. So that you start now the process from 1st of January for the second year, 1st January, 2022. So those are the two areas I, I, I have, but for now, I'll also give my colleagues to, com to comment about the various problems they can foresee the PTD program. Thank you. Sorry, Rose, I, I think Francis, yeah, I agree with you. The, the only place where maybe I'm wrong, I don't agree is that uh, what the law says is that you must pay in year one. Uh, so not only do you need to file, but you need to pay as well right. uh, to, to benefit. Yes. Uh, uh, and, and you're right, what the system seems to suggest is file, we'll approve, then you pay. Uh, but it seems to me that if we're going self-assessment, I should be able to file and pay at the same time. KRA may not agree with it. There might be some changes. You might have to refund me. I might have to pay a bit more, but that should be done. The, uh, the third thing I think that is going to become a problem is that with the change in the finance bill, of taking things from five years to seven years for assessment raising and record keeping, uh, but yet the amnesty is a five is five years. So I declare everything that five years, and suddenly I find KRAs on my back for the the preceding two years, which are now within within their rights to do, and and I get penalised for that. So I, I think there's a need to change, uh, well either take away the seven years and put back to five. Or, or at least uh, change the amnesty law to make it seven years rather than five. So the seven years preceding 1st July 15, what I would suggest. While we still have you, Nihil, maybe you can also handle the question on minimum tax, whether it overlaps with you know, other tax regimes such as installment tax, turnover tax, etc. Um, does it overlap with uh, turnover tax? No, I don't think so. Because I think that's a, that, that, that's a completely separate tax in, in its entirety. Uh, does it overlap with in, installment tax? To some extent it does, but what, what it says is that if you're paying more installments than minimum tax required, then you don't pay minimum tax. If you're paying less installments than minimum tax, you pay minimum tax. Uh, the point that it doesn't say is that if I have got installments that are less than minimum tax, what is to stop me from just paying additional installments? So if I've got minimum tax of 100 and, and installments of 90, what is to stop me just paying 110 in installments? And the advantage being that, of course, installments can be carried forward. Minimum tax is a, is a sunk cost. 
the, the law is silent on that. So maybe I'm being a bit aggressive here, but uh, uh, you know, I mean, that's, that's a clarity that's required. Um, does it offend the charging clause in the Income Tax Act? Yeah, absolutely. Because it, the, the charging clause is talking about income, not turnover. Um, and, and I think that's, that's, a, that's a problem. Yeah, and can I just uh, jump in there, Nikhil? I think the other, the other problem we have with minimum tax is that um, a lot of the sort of clarity that, that, that is trying to be brought in is being brought in by the guideline. Uh, so, so, you know, the guideline is trying to say that, for example, you know, if you have tax losses, how do you deal with that? If you have a, if you have a, a tax credit, how do you deal with that? If, for example, you, you have withholding tax that you have paid, how do you deal with that? But, but the reality and the real challenge we face is that the guidelines, in my view, are not properly uh, promulgated. Because when you look at the Income Tax Act, first of all, who has the power to create guidelines? You know? The power to create guidelines sits with the commissioner for, uh, I mean, sorry, for, for the cabinet secretary for the national treasury. And then the second question you ask yourself is where guidelines can be created. For example, uh, under section 12, you know, minimum taxes in section 12D. But if you look at section 12A, 12B, uh, it specifically says that, and the commissioner is empowered to issue guidelines. So the power to issue guidelines cannot just be, you know, it's not, you, you, you can't just issue the guidelines. The law needs to say that you're empowered to issue the guidelines, which section 12D does not. So, so then you end up in a scenario where you have these guidelines that are supposed to create clarity in the law, but these guidelines sit in the air because in fact, when you look at those guidelines, there is no mention as to what law they're relying on to be promulgated. So in my view, uh, in fact, the, 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 whole, the whole thing, it's impossible for you to implement. Because for you to implement, you have to try and rely on guidelines that have no force of law. And if these guidelines were struck off by the court, in essence, what you're saying is that all the gaps that have been indicated, which are trying to be fixed by the guidelines, are there and apparent on the face of them. So, so I, I think we, we rushed too fast to try and come up with this minimum tax law. I mean, I understand the rationale. You know, we have, we, the country is trying to bridge a gap in terms of revenue collection. But we shouldn't, as, um, as taxpayers, agree that we then live with either laws that are not properly constituted or, secondly, laws that basically reach an outcome that is incorrect. And, uh, and I do hope that you know, the cases that are before the court will certainly address this, um, this gap. So Section 12D has exempted uh, uh, from a uh, uh, minimum tax, the PYE under Section 5. It has exempted 12C, turnover tax. It has exempted 6A, which is rental residential income tax. It has exempted capital gains and, uh, of course, um, the extractive sector. So the guidelines, you'll see them including 12B, which is digital, but it's not in the law. But those are some of the areas which we are trying to see how they can be done. And I've seen the G7 finance ministers and, of course, the other particular characters uh, coming from central banks trying to say that... Uh, we need to instill a minimum tax, but for them, it's not on turnover. Most likely, it's looking at it from a profit perspective. Good thing is that uh, um, Kenya, not good. The bad thing is that Kenya is looking at it from a financial perspective. So I've seen some things going to the media that we should embrace is minimum tax because of G7. Please, for those who are basically looking at it, and you see it's, a, it's from a profit perspective, it's not from a turnover perspective. So something we need to... Uh, be well aware that we don't just comment without reading what the G7, um, the other particular teams talked about. Back to you, Rose. Thank you. I, I, I think if, I, I wish we could go, because there's so much material to go on for hours and hours discussing everything that's coming up. So thank you all for participating. Thank you also for the attendee, to the attendees for engaging us. I'm certain, you know, we've learned a thing or two regarding the G7 minimum tax and BEPS. So many that people had not thought about. So we thank you for your time. We know today is important because of the, the budget reading um, and you made time to be here with us. So we are very grateful for that. And I, I think we can now release you to go back to effective duties. So I'll back to Alan and Alex um, so that they can close the session for us. And thanks again, Francis, Nihil, and Daniel for being here.
Thank you, Rose. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rose. Thank you, Nikhil. Thank you, Francis. Thank you, Daniel. There's a comment from Gregory which says, I am delighted to have learned so much at the feet of this great panel for free. Had I been able to settle their fees, I would have remitted the same urgently after taxation. With that bite, have a good afternoon and thank you so much for uh, giving your time to speak to us. Um, much appreciated. Alan, so, Alan, can I interrupt and say we'll happily accept the fees? It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Not a problem, Gregory. I think uh, I'll give you the address for Nikhil, um, as well as Francis and Daniel and Rose too. Thank you so much for our attendees. Uh, stay on. We have in the next five minutes, we begin the next panel on corporate governance. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, good afternoon, Professor. We are starting in a few minutes. I was wondering whether the, the webinar was over. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just adding the other panelists and then we start in a few. Uh, good afternoon. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. Good. Um, hi, everybody, and welcome back to our last panel, which is going to be on corporate governance. And, you know, what, what a summit. It's been two days of a marathon of panels um, with over 40 practitioners. And, you know, it's been, it's been quite, 
uh, a hectic two days. And of course, we are going to finish with a topic that, you know, um, cannot be more relevant than today. And especially considering now as we start, um, uh, you know, as, 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 as parts of the world start recovering and waiting to see whether we are going to have the, the roaring 20s again. So we'll just wait and see that. But corporate governance remains uh, a key thing for corporate law in Kenya. And of course, even more, more and more as environmental, social and governance becomes a really critical topic. And to lead our panel um, this evening, as we close the summit, is Malakai Adede. And Malakai Adede has over 10 years experience in corporate governance work and is mainly involved in supporting multi-sectoral boards, advising on company secretarial matters, drafting board charters and committee TORs, minutes, resolutions, providing routine compliance services to both local companies and foreign companies registered in Kenya, Uganda and, and Tanzania. He's the founding partner and chief executive of Liroja Services, which is a corporate governance consulting based in Westlands, Nairobi. Uh, Malakai holds a, a Bachelor of Science degree from Strathmore University and is currently pursuing a master's degree in public policy and management also at Strathmore University. He's a member of the Institute of Certified Secretaries Kenya, an accredited governance auditor and a certified secretary. And you know, after laying out that last year's career of Malakai, I'd love to now yield the screen um, to you to, to lead uh, our corporate governance panel today. Thank you and welcome Malakai. Uh, thank you very much, Alex, uh, for the uh, introduction. And uh, we are indeed, we do continue to be glad that uh, Strathmore Bowman's is uh, gone ahead to spearhead uh, this summit. Uh, this is going to be useful uh, for us and from the conversations we've been hearing, we can't wait for uh, summit number two uh, in the not so distant future. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, the panelists uh, for today. Uh, as has been highlighted, the main topic for the day is corporate governance and what has happened within the last uh, 10 years. Uh, I will start with uh, Winnie Jumba, uh, who is a principal senior manager with Bowman's Kenya. Winnie has over 20 years of experience as a practicing certified secretary and a corporate governance expert. She is an experienced and dedicated company secretary with additional specializations in corporate governance services, legal and uh, governance audits, and bond trustee or security agency services and general compliance matters. Winnie provides a full spectrum of uh, corporate services from setup of legal entities, continuing compliance services, uh, specialist legal support for new applications for licensed entities, restructuring and reorganizations, and transaction, transaction support on reorganization involving private and listed entities. Her other mainstream expertise includes corporate governance services, uh, drafting of governance policies and procedures, governance tools, board and management effective programs, uh, she also acts as a coach and mentor to executive and non-executive directors. She has also been a bond and shares registrar and uh, further acted as trustee uh, uh, for borrowing facilities, employee share option plans, and escrow uh, arrangements. Winnie is well versed uh, with applicable corporate laws and other statutory regulations across the region. She is a regular trainer and facilitator with the Institute of Certified Secretaries. Prior to joining Bowman's, Winnie was an associate director at Deloitte, uh, East Africa. Our second panelist is uh, Mr. Kenneth Gaduma, who is the director general for the business registration services. Uh, Mr. Gaduma is an advocate of the High Court of Kenya who has legal advisory uh, skills developed through providing legal advice to government ministries and state-owned corporations for more than 12 years. Until his appointment as the Director General in March 2020, Mr. Gaduma was the Acting Director General of BRS and formerly served as Deputy Head of Government Transactions in the Office of the Attorney General and Department of Justice. Uh, where large government development projects were arranged and concluded. He holds a Bachelor of Laws degree from the University of Nairobi. For those who have been following uh, tech news in Kenya, to you, I may not need to 
uh, introduce a uh, third panelist, uh, Professor Bitang Demo, who is a professor of entrepreneurship at the University of Nairobi. Uh, professor uh, Bitang Demo is professor of entrepreneurship. Uh, his research centers on the link between ICT and small and medium enterprises with emphasis on how ICT influences economic development in Africa. Professor Ndemo chaired the Kenya Distributed Ledgers and Artificial Intelligence Task Force that developed the country's uh, roadmap for digital transformation. He is an advisor and board member to several organizations, including Safaricom, one of the leading tel telecom uh, companies in Africa. He's a member of the OECD expert panel for blockchain, uh, World Economic Forum Global Blockchain Council, which is part of the World Economic Forum's Global Fourth Industrial Revolution Councils. Besides having been a permanent secretary of Kenya's Ministry of Information and Communication, where he was credited with facilitating many transformative ICT projects, a senior advisor to UN's Global Pulse, a big data initiative, and the UNCDF's Better Than Cash Alliance and UNICEF's Innovation Council. He is an open data or big data evangelist and dedicated to simplification of visualization of data for ordinary citizens to consume. He writes two columns every week for the Business Daily and Nation uh, online. Uh, you are welcome, uh, ladies, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as was earlier mentioned by Alex, the panel today will focus on the role, responsibility and duties of directors, the role of government agencies in corporate governance, the role of technology in enhancing corporate governance, the impact of ESG on Kenya's corporate governance regime and building of effective boards, the challenges and future of corporate governance in Kenya. Uh, going through the topical issues uh, that we have today, it would be very useful to understand uh, generally by all the panelists, a brief remarks on how uh, has corporate governance in Kenya changed over the last decades any notable trends and developments that uh, have been seen and how those have affected uh, the practice itself. I will start with Winnie, and then go around the table. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you, Malakai, for the good introduction. Um, and uh, I think for me, I'll speak so much out of uh, my practical uh, experience um, in the market and in terms of what has changed. And uh, one of the biggest uh, factors that have, have created change in terms of uh, corporate governance really has been the landscape uh, uh, coming out of the changes in the laws and the regulations. And um, to understand how these changes came about uh, is to look at the events that influenced all these changes in the laws. Uh, if we look at the milestone, where significant change started happening, which was in the early 2000s, what we had happening globally was that we had a, a, a crisis that was happening and the weight of it was actually happening in the US. And there was a lot of uh, financial um, difficulty and failures and uh, failures of financial institutions that happened. And uh, coming out of the heat of uh, those uh, financial failures and uh, corporate failures, there was a lot of change in the way things need to be done and the way oversight needs to be given. And we started to see uh, a big shift and change in the way the laws were beginning to look at some of these things. And uh, the biggest change came really from the aspect of um, the companies that are especially uh, public in nature and those ones which were uh, uh, listed and, uh, uh, and uh, the, the separation in terms of what was the role of the people who need to give assurance and governance came in. And then coming out of that evolution, we started to see across uh, globally, a lot of changes now beginning to happen with a lot of shifts coming in the companies at space where we started to see a lot of um, uh, our countries looking at their, their founding acts and looking at what was in there and seeing that a lot of uh, those laws needed to change so that uh, the way we view governance starts to change and that has taken its own course. Uh, thank you, Winnie. 
I will ask the same uh, question uh, to Mr. Kaduma. You can give a few comments on uh, how the corporate governance landscape has changed within the last 10 years. Uh, thank you, Malakai and uh, fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, Malakai, my introduction uh, could have, I should have given you a more up-to-date uh, collection of the things I pretend to do here and the kind of reform agenda that I have been trying to, we have been trying to really implement in the last couple of years. Um, I do wish to basically just pick up where Winnie left off and say that. Of course, there's a context within which corporate governance reform has been really pushed as an item of what I call good governance in general. Um, we look at this from the landscape, especially when I talk about it from a government perspective, we talk about uh, the economic pillar of the vision 2030, where one of the key issues that we need, need to be supported was entrepreneurship and governance within the corporate sector. And, um, Within that came, the, of course, the 2015 Act, which codified quite a number of principles in good governance. And uh, we talk about a situation where one of the key supporters of the good governance, meaning technology, was, of course, embedded. The use of electronic documents and structures was really woven into the Companies Act. And uh, as well, we had quite a bit of uh, codification of what I would call old company law principles which have got to do with really fiduciary duties of directors. And this was put in law for really the purposes of uh, clear enforcement within the ranks of uh, members of companies and as well regulators who really keep an eye on the going zone of a company. Um, I know that uh, we will be talking later about uh, the issue of technology and how it impacts on corporate governance, but a very simple, or what I would call a very direct impact on the way that our companies are run really came about with the reform agenda that was propagated within the company's registry under the auspices, of course, of the business registration service, where we've now had a um, much more simpler way within which you're able to have line of sight of documents that really support good governance measures within companies, and as well, giving people the opportunity to have a platform within which they can have line of sight of their compliance requirements on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it's still days to go before we say that we are in a good space, but uh, the significant uh, key to report uh, issue here is that there are strides that are being done towards moving this in the right direction. And I think um, with those two issues, basically, and of course, talk about the enhanced duties of directors, uh, which have been embodied in the Companies Act, the issues to do with the success of the company being caught what directors do, and of course, issues to do with the conflict of interest also being codified within the Companies Act. I think that's a very major shift with regard to making people accountable for the day-to-day -day runnings of our company. I think I'll stop there in the interest of time. Thank you, Malakai. Uh, thank you very much for, for the comments. Uh, to you, Professor, uh, giving the same uh, uh, issue some thought and probably highlighting how technology has also uh, influenced uh, the last 10 years, any key developments uh, that you may want to uh, mention? Thank you uh, for the opportunity. And I think my panelists have said a lot <clears throat> about this. Uh, but one of the significant things that you see that has changed in the the composition of the boards. Even though we have not uh, reached the targets, uh, provisions of the constitution, for example, uh, we have seen a significant number of women join the boards. And uh, ordinarily from research, women generally think differently from men. Uh, the way they approach risk is much more different than that of men. And you actually see that uh, Boards. Then uh, some of the things that uh, we would have expected to do um, haven't quite changed. Though the legal frameworks are changing, we need to see um, a lot more changes. But since the question was what has changed, I will stick to the composition. And uh, as you rightly say, 
um, a lot needs to change with respect to technology because we are deploying a lot of technologies, uh, but uh, we still have a challenge with uh, technology because when you deploy technology, you need to know the risks that come with it. If you look at the discussions of the audit committees, uh, they mostly focus on, oh, this is the percentage of the audits that we've done. Yet, we have technologies that uh, they could virtually do all the audits, and the population of the audits in the organization. So I would say there is some disappointment with respect to implementation of uh, technology. And it's a must that we begin to look into that direction. I think I'll get some time in the, before we finish for me to expound on that. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. You've uh, talked about uh, uh, a matter that then moves us to the next uh, discussion point, uh, which is the board uh, composition and how uh, the board is actually constituted to achieve its, its mandate. And this question really goes to, uh, to win on, uh, to, to, to make a few comments on how the needs and requirements of, of boards of directors uh, in the country have changed over uh, the last decade. Has there been any change uh, on that front? Uh, Malakai, I think um, uh, there they have been a lot of changes and I think the changes have come from so many quarters um, which have really contributed to why the face of the board has changed. If we first of all look at uh, uh, aspects of um, I think what uh, Professor is uh, talking about in terms of the way the business is currently being done. Uh, we find that the business models have completely uh, transformed because of technology and the way things need to be done. And that in itself has, uh, has, has necessitated a lot of change in the way uh, businesses are structured and the delivery models. And when you look at that, it also changes the risk framework for these institutions. So we then find that there's a lot more um, focus or there should be a lot more focus in terms of the, the controls environment and how things are happening in that controls environment. So clearly the, the technology has completely shifted the, the, the businesses and also shifted the way the, the, the risks are being looked at um, uh, from that aspect. And then other aspects of the way businesses are being done because we are now very global in the way we do business. So the geographical footprint has also changed the way business is being done. And uh, uh, when you now look at the geographical um, footprints, it then means that the dynamics of different cultures, different, different places, different peoples, and the way things are being done have to be factored into the business model and the way things are being done. So um, when you now look at uh, those kinds of things, then you, you find that the kind of oversight that uh, directors need to give is at a different level. And um, what we have now seen in the last decade is that um, the composition of the boards has completely changed to, re to, to more or less respond to all these changes. Uh, one of the significant change I can speak to in terms of composition of the board is we started to see the structures of the board beginning to change from inside us and having now a mix of both insiders and outsiders. So what I mean by that is that uh, earlier on, you'd find that people related to the business would principally be the people who were driving uh, the businesses and literally being the directors of the business. But now when you look at the way the composition and structures of the board is, and because of the kind of skill sets that are, are needed on the board and the kind of independent thinking that is required, a lot of boards now are structured such that there's an invitation for more independent thinking onto the board and therefore more independent directors being invited onto that board. Uh, other aspects have also been recognized, again, speaking to what Professor has, has spoken about in terms of diversity. There's a lot more appreciation for diversity on the boards. And um, 
I know a lot of times when we speak about diversity, we speak out, we, we tend to gravitate towards gender, but they, it's going beyond that where we're also looking at the age profile. And now it's not just about the wazes being on the, on the board, but really looking at a good blend and mix of uh, people who have different perspectives sitting on the board. So we, are do, we do have a lot of those kinds of um, changes happening. Then again, uh, again, because of the risk that we've spoken about in terms of business, uh, we are also seeing the structures of boards changing even further, where you even find that um, some boards actually uh, commission or, or bring in place what we call technical or advisory boards, who are just uh, a creation or an, a, a separate type of board that is in place to give advisory support to these boards. So really, um, the, 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 the look and the feel and the way the boards are operating has completely changed. I can also speak to the needs in terms of um, the knowledge base of uh, the, the directors really changing. And now we see a lot of um, appetite and also consumption of uh, board training uh, and or, 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 or board development happening, uh, which is something which I can say 10 years ago was not quite common or prevalent or maybe appreciated. But I think this is now being appreciated because directors are now more increasingly aware of their role and also aware that they must continuously continue to develop their skills to be able to be um, functional and also to be, um, to be able to, 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 to execute their fiduciary duties in the right manner. So quite a bit has changed in terms of how the needs and the, and the way boards are looking has come up in the last 10 years. Absolutely. Now, as, as you are outlaying uh, the various changes on the composition, on the structures, on the skill sets, on uh, the advisory role uh, that has been developed, there is a particular niche uh, uh, called family businesses. Uh, it will be interesting, uh, Mr. Kazuma, from your uh, view uh, as the regulator, whether there are any corporate governance uh, stories or uh, developments that have happened uh, for major family businesses in Kenya uh, within the last decade or so, from which we can learn les lessons worth sharing uh, with the uh, participants today. Thank you, Malakai. And uh, again, I, I, keep see, uh, I keep having to pick up from where Winnie has left off. It seems this is quite a, a, a logical conversation. Indeed, uh, a lot of what Winnie has spoken to with regard to the way the structure and the content of boards has changed over the last number of years, is uh, basically what she said. You've seen some transition from boards of these family-led companies, quite some of which are quite big uh, businesses uh, locally and uh, internationally, which have now started uh, having an approach where they are onboarding technical uh, advisors to the boards to give them some kind of uh, what we call infusion of expertise and uh, content that uh, is able to really give them the ability to focus and move to the next level. Um, that said, I must give a rider though that uh, the, the traditional family-led business falls within the category of the what the word is used, notorious non-compliant businesses. Um, they feel that they have influenced their uh, what I would call their resources within that company and lo and behold nobody is supposed to question who or what they really make in terms of decisions. They know best what is supposed to run but uh, they are taking a cue from especially what we have said when there's some kind of sensitization training and development of these boards where they get to hear that there's value to be really obtained by having a diversity within the board and as well as well to, uh, what I would call uh, input that would uh, give them some kind of um, what I would call secondary or tertiary involvement in the business sense so that they stop doing things in a basic way and are able to more or less interact with their value chains in a bit of a much more responsive way. Um, a question that was posed to me earlier was with regard to this family-led uh, or rather family companies is uh, the way in which the decisions are made. 
needs to really be understood, especially from the corporate governance and the, the what would call the new companies act requirements. Before we used to see what would call the all powerful chairman who used to load upon the rest of the, of the what would call membership about how things ought to be run. But uh, you will find that uh, in recent uh, findings that we've seen, there has been a challenge to that autocratic way within which uh, boards are run. And you find that uh, people are exercising, especially when we talk about uh, the, the members of this company, they're exercising their rights to both appoint uh, directors to these boards and as well exercise the right to really seek some kind of um, what would call scrutiny on the affairs of the company, where you see that they want to have uh, audits done on the, the numbers of these particular companies. As well, they want to establish whether there's a, a proper chain of uh, documents that really establish decision making. And really, it's more or less the entitlement of the members that is being cultivated as a matter of uh, democratic principles, which are enshrined within the companies that. And as well, you could call it uh, a way that has changed in the way things are done, that people have now made more accountable with regard to the conduct of the affairs of each and every one of these companies. And as well, um, Malaka, as I close my contribution on this subject, um, the mandatory requirement for gender meetings really has revised the way that companies were run, where you find that uh, the specific requirements for these particular companies to actively and actually discuss the affairs of the company at a meeting convened uh, once a year really gives some impetus to the members and the, um, the directors to be responsible for what really is discussed in those fora. Uh, I think that uh, basically it's a evolution that is happening a bit slowly though, but for those who have picked it up, we can say we've seen a significant amount of uh, really uh, transformation in terms of the governance and the documents which are lodged in the company's registry to really put these people into account. Uh, Malaka, I think I may stop uh, there in the interest of time. Uh, thank you. I think I'll uh, pose the same question to uh, Professor on, in terms of uh, how uh, within the last 10 years, what are some of the lessons that uh, uh, could be learned from the successes or failures of family businesses, businesses in Kenya uh, that you could share with the uh, participants today? Well, before I say family, um, let me first distinguish the public and the public owned by, by the state. I think there has been total failure on the state-owned enterprise. And, and this is because of parents from politics I think that is the wrong category to have in law that they should not be chairing or participating in that. Because when you talk about corporate governance, what you bring, if there is individual corporate governance, the person you bring on to the board. And uh, we, we need to, it will be wrong for us. Uh, leave this discussion without bringing that aspect very clearly that there is a problem. I mean, there, there is a problem with respect to the public enterprise. Not the listed ones, but um, you know which ones we're talking about. Uh, on family owned, um, yes, there is some progress that is being made, um, but not much, not much. Uh, and I, I don't think family owns text or call or any AGM. Um, and if you see the kind of uh, board members we bring on, they're actually advisors. Mm -hmm. You don't have uh, not much to say as a, as a, as a board member. Um, you can only suggest, but, but not to try to enforce uh, some of the standards that are imposed by, uh, as it is applied by corporate governance. Uh, thank you, Professor, uh, for those comments. Uh, I, I, I believe this has been alluded before on uh, uh, the Professor first 
talk about the composition of the board. Uh, Winnie has uh, made some comments on uh, uh, the composition being uh, looked at from the point of view of diversity and diversity is not only based on gender, it's also based on the, the age, uh, the skill sets. So the big question is, uh, what is the state of the gender inclusion and diversity uh, within the corporate governance of major companies in Kenya? That is true. Uh, yes, Professor. And yes. then the same question will also be attempted. Uh, yes, uh, by... I, I, I don't think we have reached the threshold. Um, we have done some progress, but uh, it hasn't quite reached, just like Parliament. We have not met, uh, we can't be proudly say that we have met the requirement of the, of the constitution, meaning 30% of the constitution has to be of uh, another gender. Uh, Winnie? <laughs> That's an interesting question. And, um... And you know this 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 question of of uh, of uh, diversity, and I think this particular question is addressing the aspect of um, of uh, gender in particular, and um, and it's 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 a very very interesting um, dynamic because um, I think about a year or two ago um, there was a report that Deloitte had prepared that was on a global scale that was trying to look at um, women in boards. And uh, the findings in that paper was actually very surprising because um, whereas uh, a lot of uh, these themes around diversity and inclusion are driven from the West, uh, the numbers actually showed that uh, the inclusion from the West was the, was the worst in terms of performance. And in the West, we are talking about the US and uh, the Canada block. And uh, what the finding showed was that uh, when you looked at the Asian bloc, it actually is the one that had performed best in terms of uh, uh, women inclusion in boards and women participation in, at the board level. And then looking also at um, Australia, there was a very good um, uh, effort coming from that block. And interesting enough, but I think the study had picked Rwanda. Of course, the study then had a bias because we know that Rwanda has a better ratio in terms of women uh, representation in leadership roles. So it's very, very interesting the way uh, th those findings came out. Uh, what um, I've practically observed is that there is now a lot of effort in the conversations around searching for board members where uh, the, it, the boards are becoming a bit intentional in trying to look for uh, uh, women. Uh, to sit on boards. The challenge that starts to come is people start to question, where are these women? Which becomes a very interesting question. So you then find that uh, one of the things that seems to be blocking the participation of women in boards to the level that is required is that the network is still not as aggressive uh, to be able to find and place uh, women uh, as quickly or as well as would have been intended. But the spirit to look for women, I must say, I have seen it in boards, where boards say that for the next uh, vacancy, let's look for, or let's try as much as possible to look for women. So if I look at my assessment, uh, uh, it is a question of looking and asking the question that what then happens when women leave senior executive roles, why don't they go up all the way and, and fill up uh, the board roles. So that is still um, a gap area and uh, we are not seeing the numbers coming in as quickly as we would have loved to see the numbers coming in. Uh, thank you. Uh, and now I want to throw the same cup to, uh, to to the regulator of companies. Uh, I do appreciate that this is not a mandatory requirement uh, to do have gender inclusion and diversity within the boardroom. But from your experience, Mr. Kaduma, are, are, you, are you noticing any changes uh, or differences between companies that have some element of gender inclusivity and those who don't in terms of the matters that uh, you need to regulate over? Uh, Malaka, I don't know how to 
sugar coat the answer to that question because it cannot be a good answer. Uh, indeed, uh, a majority of the officials or directors of companies you'd find would be men uh, when you look at the kind of findings that we see regularly. Indeed, most of the, the companies that you find to be a bit compliant would be the listed companies. That's why you find a bit of uh, um, what would call balance with regards to the directorship and the, the people who are on the boards. But um, traditionally, I wouldn't say there's any shift towards the constitutional requirement of uh, one, one third of having either gender within the board. As well, diversity, when you talk about um, as well people with disabilities, uh, people who really need to, who are called marginalized, who need to be included in these boards. It's not something that is a tangible uh, development to talk about today. Um, this is something that really, uh, as panelists and as uh, contributors to this particular session, need to, um, as we say, actively pursue when we are doing further and uh, what we're talking about advisory roles to how companies ought to really constitute their directors, directorship to address the various uh, diversity requirements that are put in place. But to answer your question in a very brief and uh, uh, succinct way is that no, there's not a lot of compliance other than listed companies. Uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, I think this question uh, goes back to, to, to Winnie. Uh, in, in your view, what is the role and future of ESG uh, in corporate governance uh, in Kenya? Uh, I think, you know, as we were talking about this issue of diversity, I was already thinking about how, how else do we push out some of these themes so that uh, it becomes something that uh, we are publicly, publicly accountable to. And uh, clearly when you look at um, uh, the issue of uh, um, ESG, and I think for the benefit of everybody else on the call, uh, ESG would then is, a, is the abbreviation for the environment, uh, the social and governance um, elements uh, that uh, we would be reporting on. Then you find that there is a very big future in, I mean, actually ESG is the future, if I can put it that way. And uh, basically, um, these are the same questions that investors will be asking and, uh, and uh, the investor is not just the person who is putting in money, but we are also looking at stakeholders. These are people who want to associate uh, with uh, an institution and they would be asking these questions. And uh, the most important thing they want to understand is that what informs your value system? Uh, who is governing you? Uh, how do you do what you do? And uh, once, um, uh, the, the, that kind of information is available, then the, level, the kinds of alignment that people want to align to start to, to, to come up. Now, when you look at, um, when we say the future, I think, and uh, um, Malachi basically said the future is already here with us as we speak, is because if you look at even the manner of reporting, already there is, um, uh, the, there's initiatives that are ongoing at uh, the Nairobi Stock Exchange, which is the key regulator in terms of reporting, that uh, is going to put in place um, mandatory ESG reporting for the listed companies. And we do know that once uh, things move in that direction, that becomes the benchmark on reporting. Uh, uh, elements of that reporting are already in place, because if you look at the corporate governance reporting, we are already there because we are now reporting on governance, uh, it is now mandatory for the listed companies to report on governance. We are reporting on uh, executive remuneration. It is now mandatory. It is part of our laws um, in the Companies Act, and it is also part of what is sitting in the codes that we do have. So we are already there. And if you look at also what uh, the, the regulator, the capital markets, for instance, is looking for, is that it has already put the aspiration in the code and it says that we need to now go into integrated reporting. But then again, you look and say, why would this become necessary? And uh, this, this all becomes necessary because we are all operating in one world. 
and that uh, the business of the world is now everybody's business. So everybody, I mean, when you're looking at how you're operating, um, uh, the factors around how you, you make your profits, how you run your business, how you source for your materials, uh, the labor conditions that you work under are now actually matters that concern every stakeholder who would be dealing with you. So it would, it is, the, it is in our interest that even when we are talking about it, that is that the stakeholder who would want to interact with you would want to know that you are an equal or an, a partner that they would want to work with. So clearly, when you look at ESG, um, that is the future of, uh, of, of reporting, basically. Uh, thank you for those comments. Uh, from Professor's earlier comment on the deployment of technology and uh, uh, the lack of appreciation of uh, some of the risks uh, that then uh, uh, come with that. Uh, could you make some further comments on, uh, for example, what kind of measures uh, could be put in place to, st to strengthen the corporate governance framework within the boardroom or in the audit committee uh, uh, processes? Okay. Um... Thanks. I, I wanted to, to, to add to Winnie, uh, then I can answer that question on sure, ESG. Sure. ESG. There's only one company in this country that uh, explicitly went public and talked about ESG. And uh, because of that, if you go to that company, you can see how many people with uh, vulnerable uh, areas, the disabled, um, they have Quotas and this diversity, uh, the benefits are huge that we need to legislate so that every other company can look at the pressing social issues the way it has happened and that company keeps on doing well. Um, on this aspect of uh, technology, um, because I sit in several boards across, across the world, um, and then I teach also, um, there is an imagining issue that, that is virtually in all companies, almost 70% uh, of companies globally, they discuss about uh, how to survive in the age of intelligence. Um, already we have AI as part of uh, the fourth industrial revolution. But it is, it is taking us much longer to appreciate the role of artificial intelligence in terms of reduction of uh, fraud, for example. Um, studies from BWC show that uh, fraud global, is a global problem and uh, almost uh, $2.3 trillion uh, or $3.3 trillion uh, get lost either corruption or fraud. And what is reducing that amount uh, from 2007 is the application of artificial intelligence, which gives you much more details. Artificial intelligence comes from uh, analytics of data at a very advanced level. We have too much data, which we are not looking at. There is no organization globally that is not leveraging data to make decisions. But you still find most of our decisions are not based on concrete data. What do we do from here? How do we go forward? Then you find that we are not completing audits. Uh, we are still in the old path where we keep on talking, or we manage to do 60% of the audits or 70% of, of the systems, that is what have done. Yet, very complex companies are doing the entire audit and even auditing the systems to see the risks that are coming with it. Um, we have new risks now. We never used to talk about cybersecurity because we have digital. Um, if we can't begin to develop capacity in that space, and yet we have deployed all these systems, then we are into much greater risk than we were before when we were analog. So when you begin to digitize, 
then you have to take the whole board with it and the whole management begins to understand that we actually need a comprehensive, uh, what you call comprehensive audit is 100%. And it has to be done regularly because there are systems which can help you to do that. I am not saying this to that people begin to say, oh, I, artificial intelligence is a big thing. It is being applied. Um, we never used to borrow money without collateral. Now you borrow money without collateral because AI is, uh, has done the analytics and even the risks are much lower. This is what I'm trying to say. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, it is true that uh, there are certain uh, developments that have made uh, uh, boards and uh, other decision-making organs within the organization to, to focus on the use of uh, big data and to, to consider how that impacts uh, their business on an ongoing basis. And one of uh, the issues that gave everyone uh, a jolt uh, is the, the COVID uh, pandemic that made everyone now start to look at their business processes uh, from a completely different uh, point of view. Uh, I will start from Mr. Gaduma, from a regulator point of view, or from your personal view. Uh, how do you see uh, the effect of uh, the pandemic to, uh, to, to, to businesses in, and how does that affect their corporate governance processes? Thank you, Malakai. Um, yeah, you need to portray me to be a bit more friendly than you are. I'm not a regulator, I'm a service provider. I'm here to your back and call to make sure that I facilitate what you do. I'm not here to police you in that traditional sense. Um, but uh, more than uh, to, to, to service provider going forward. A service provider, your <laughs> servant is here to, to do what you so pray that he does. Um, that's the kind of culture we are trying to really cultivate in terms of showing the public and you our stakeholders that we are here to do things a bit differently to the extent that uh, we are here to serve you in the mandate that is provided to us. But before I continue with my PR part, because I think that's part of my KPIs that I have told you that I'm here to be a servant, let me talk about the issue of um, the COVID experience that we've had at the company's registry. Um, we've had quite a bit of uh, a proactive uh, sector in terms of uh, the companies that really realized that their articles of association did not allow them to hold uh, what I would call either hybrid or electronic or virtual meetings. So they, under Section 280 of the Companies Act, went to court uh, under the CAPSA umbrella, and uh, they got an exception which allowed them to conduct their meetings. As a matter of all, of course, good corporate governance that you need to have your general meetings within uh, which you do your reporting, you do um, your election of uh, or, or the rotation of directors, but mainly let's talk about the election of new directors or indeed re-election of directors who um, form part of that particular company. Um, that said, uh, we did... Uh, of course, uh, initiate a number of legislative amendments within uh, the Business Laws Amendment Act of 2021. Uh, and we did have a bit of interaction with the stakeholders concerning what they felt ought to be the standard within which uh, what is globally acceptable to be the, the bare minimums of a meeting being conducted, either on a purely virtual uh, forum or on a hybrid sense where you have a couple of uh, members in a uh, physical gathering, and then you have the others joining in or joining in uh, using a digital platform to, to that particular general meeting. Um, it has been successful because we've had the amendment passed, and uh, today, as it stands, the Companies Act does recognize a virtual meeting to be a meeting for the intents and purposes of the Companies Act. And uh, as well, we've seen uh, that uh, there has been a, a large drive towards certain companies restructuring in the face of uh, the COVID pandemic. Uh, a lot of what really we have seen is that um, companies sometimes have wanted to really 
change the way that they do business and want to engage in certain avenues. And uh, we've seen what I'd call a bit of uh, re-engineering of both how the companies perceive business is being done. And uh, this has seen a raft of changes being introduced in the company's registry, where you have new shareholders being brought on board, where you have a different set of directors. And uh, we have had as well some companies really change their articles to give them the, the, the latitude to perform other kind of businesses. Um, as well, and I think it would be very critical for us to mention here that a lot of the businesses that were registered in the last year really were to do with formalizing of what people called either their side hustle or something that was uh, what, what was an informal hustle that they used to do with their partners. And in the sense of uh, really ingraining corporate governance and what I would call legal personality and uh, structures to these businesses, the highest number of businesses we have, we've ever seen registered in the history of the company's registry actually happened in the year 2020. A lot of people who thought that uh, basically they need to look at uh, the way they do business in a different way and so to speak incorporate for the purposes of this. And this goes a long way when we talk about infusion of credit and especially access to credit. You want uh, to have some kind of corporate structure within which lending can be done. Uh, we've seen that uh, trajectory really somewhat be maintained even in the year 2021. And uh, a lot has to do with either the awareness that is being created and the knowledge that there are these structures that are alternative to traditional employment opportunities that have been put on board. And we believe, again, this is one of the ways within which you can have uh, businesses uh, really latch onto corporate governance as part and parcel of what will really improve the way that they do their entrepreneurial activities and engage with other players in the sector, as well as with government. Of course, you know that uh, for you to do business with the government, you have to have some form of um, registration, either in the basic elements of a business name, but uh, more, more or less in a company form within which, uh, of course, uh, that is a key requirement before you are allowed to do business. And I'm not saying that corporate governance has been well used at times. We have seen, of course, briefcase companies which have been set up and go to do business with government with huge amounts of money. And I hope I'm not opening a Pandora's box here in terms of the discussion. Uh, I'm just saying that, yes, enterprises are registered to do all manner of things, some good, some not very good, but it's for us to really ensure that we are policing these particular persons who come on board. But uh, I think I will stop at that. This is what we have noted in the last year or so. Uh, business as usual has changed and uh, we believe the evolution of the way things are done is really going to be with us for quite some time going forward. Uh, Malakai? Uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, Professor, if you can share with us some insights on how you see the COVID pandemic affecting the corporate governance landscape. Thank you, I think um, uh, we had this yesterday with you and, um, and practically everybody is saying it was a blessing in disguise because it has fast-tracked the adoption of digital services and brought um, improved the way we deliver services uh, with, uh, uh, with very lean staff in the offices. I think going forward, uh, we are going to see a lot more changes uh, with respect to how we run organizations, uh, particularly from the universities. I, I teach from undergraduate, and I can tell you uh, that uh, the graduate students will never go back, uh, which, 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 is, which would be a very huge difference because many of those graduate students are the students who work in the corporate sector, and I've had a lot of problems. Um, then from the corporate side, um, we, have, we are now beginning to study, and I think each organization needs to study, uh, how best we can del deliver work. Some organizations where I sit in the board, 70% work from here, 
and I think we have been more more efficient uh, than in the previous. Uh, and that is really surprising because uh, nobody thought that most people can work from home and the company runs and, and actually makes money out of it. So it is a blessing in disguise. We need to look, to learn from this and see whether we can create a future company. Uh, and that would change, would alter the way hiring is done. It would alter the way uh, a, a lot of things, um, the office, the home, and stuff like that. So it's been wonderful uh, because we need to talk about the social sector. Of the uh, some have had time with their children at home while working more effectively. So there is a lot more that has happened. You discriminated against uh, uh, Winnie, so she needs to answer two questions. <laughs> you are oh, muted. God. You are Malachi. You are muted. Sorry, uh, I'm customizing a question uh, for Winnie on the effect of COVID. Okay. And and, and, and I think uh, the line of thought is that uh, uh, Mr. Kaduma has uh, uh, outlined and how uh, the, the regulatory reforms that came into play to enable uh, boards and shareholders to carry on their business. Whereas uh, Professor has given uh, a, a wider view on how this affects uh, business and people's intention on how to uh, deal with it. Now, when we come to the boardroom uh, winning, how has the COVID affected how business is conducted, uh, especially the business of the board? Uh, I think, uh, again, I think what we have seen happening a lot is um, it has also uh, fast tracked the use of uh, uh, digital platforms. Uh, I, there's a lot more conversation around uh, board tools, e-board kind of tools, which was a difficult conversation to have with a lot of boards before COVID because most of them cited security as concerns as to why they were not, the uptake was poor, but now, the, 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 there is a, a very good appetite for those kinds of tools um, to be able to do that. Uh, in terms of the actual board function, uh, one, one of the interesting things we also observed is that boards actually were able to meet um, most of 2020 and most of them registered almost 100% attendance uh, during 2020. And most of them say that it's because uh, the inconvenience of the logistics of travel and being able to be available for the meetings was not, I mean, was eliminated uh, by virtue of that. Um, when it comes now to the aspects of our oversight matters, then it also brought up some agenda items uh, more closer to the board, because we saw a lot of discussions around um, uh, board continuity uh, uh, plans. Uh, and a lot of boards discovered whether they even had the BCP plans in place or not, and whether adequate testing of those plans was actually happening or not. Then other conversations around uh, human, the way the human workforce is managed or are very also very topical conversations. Again, it gave a lot of visibility to the human resources committees. And for those who didn't have those committees, there was also a, a, a drive towards having them in place because that whole factor of how do you then manage people came in and how do you manage people differently came in. And uh, some of the things that are now beginning to come, uh, which is what Professor is talking about is now around uh, the, uh, how, how the delivery models and uh, what are we now looking at in terms of productivity of people? How should they be enabled? What should we live with? Uh, should we now go into flexi type of models, et cetera? So those are the kinds of things that were, were, really, were really characterized the boardroom uh, in the COVID period and also post, post, I mean, in the 2021 period, this is, these are the kinds of conversations we continue to see at the board level. Uh, I, I think the, the bigger question then is, uh, uh, is this now the new normal or uh, do we still have some boards who are waiting to go back to how things were done before COVID. I was in a board meeting this morning and uh, one director said, 
using the word new normal because it is now the normal. <laughs> so basically the message was that I think um, we have been disrupted um, and that's a fact. And, and, uh, and I think uh, some of the benefits so what has what we have also witnessed is that they, there's, there are some benefits which have also been seen on the side of productivity. So in terms of um, normal, if I can now say it's now the, no, the, the normal that we are now in, is that there is more um, there's going to be uh, a better appreciation of embracing this way of doing things because we've had a, a process of actually testing it. No, and testing it not because we had a choice, but actually seeing also the outcome being even more positive than uh, before. So it is a, it is a, a direction most organizations are going to see how to continue supporting going forward. So in other words, this is becoming the normal. Uh, Professor, do you agree that we drop the word new from the new normal? And, Perfectly, uh, I, I agree because um, uh, even board members who used to, this is maybe they're in Mombasa, they can't fly. Uh, you can have some who are from Mombasa and some who are seated in Nairobi and it, it working perfectly well. I mean, there's nothing they're missing, they're constantly. Uh, and that's what uh, when he's saying that you almost have 100 patient. What you're looking at, is not, is not the presence in the room that you always meet as a board room. Mm. So the room itself has gone back home. <laughs> 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 Can I come on the everybody? Uh, absolutely. And uh, even the summit itself is a testament that things can change because it was originally articulated to be held in person but it's been successfully uh, held entirely uh, virtually. So indeed, this is uh, the new uh, normal. Now- and The hard part is that uh, this thing from all the readings I've seen, gonna hang around like it. So we, we have to be prepared to see. Absolutely. Now, when we talk about a concept like corporate governance, we do have actors uh, or practitioners uh, within uh, that space. And in, to some extent, when there is failure, uh, it could be attributed to the players themselves or, or the actors uh, within uh, that space. Now, the question I have today, uh, starting with you, Professor, is that what are some of the challenges that uh, are evident in the corporate governance uh, uh, practice uh, that uh, could be discussed for today? As I said earlier, that uh, we, as we talk about uh, corporate governance, we also need to talk about individual governance. You, you realize you have or seven or 10 or nine people who, are, who think independently. Just one of them uh, uses that position uh, to do what they want to do, it becomes a huge challenge uh, to the board. And it happens in some boards. Uh, because I can say I've been uh, boards from virtually everything, from the public sector to companies, private companies. Uh, it, the board is as good as each individual member of the board. And that is what becomes corporate uh, governance. Uh, so if you have two bad apples, they can put you in trouble. And, and I think that I can tell you that there are many ways that you can end up in huge trouble um, if you don't quite understand um, what it means what it means as a complete governance. Absolutely. Individual governance. Uh, yeah. Ms. Uh, uh, Gaduma, uh, when we talk about the individuals who come to you to relay some of the decisions uh, that 
were passed or should have been passed. How, how does that play out in the context of uh, good corporate governance? Uh, what are the challenges with the corporate governance practice itself that uh, you foresee? Well, uh, Malachi, just as uh, the good professor has really well articulated, um, you are really as strong as your weakest link with regards to the membership of your board and ex exactly how really things are done. Uh, I don't know how much I can say in this forum with regards to the conduct of directors and exactly what we see, but I would say that uh, there are quite a number of people who still are in the old school. They have quite a bit of what I would call impunity and belief that you can do anything you can if you have some money in your pocket. And uh, the attempt within which you find um, such errant directors trying to really alter records, both at the company's registry and the company itself in terms of its actual uh, deliberations and resolutions is a bit uh, of a concern and a bit worrisome. One of the things that we have found to be quite uh, progressive in terms of the digital space is the fact that you are able to sometimes record these meetings and they form a good record of exactly whether or not it transpired as a matter of evidence. You'll find the notion that used to happen before where people imagine there was a meeting and certain minutes are quote unquote produced and furnished to the company's registrar for enforcement um, becomes a, a matter of an evidentiary question. But I would say that uh, what by and large the challenge that we are facing here is that uh, there are still a few rotten apples out there who do not agree that corporate governance is a reality in terms of how things must be done. And uh, we are really in a sense flushing them out when we talk about really making sure that uh, there is some kind of accountability for the documents that you file and uh, citing them for the issues that they do wrongly. The Companies Act does allow the Registrar of Companies, who is Joyce Koech, I'm sure you have interacted with in, in this particular summit, to really put or push back with regards to you filing fraudulent, misleading, or uh, what I would call illegal documents in such a way that she would be able to, in a sense, put you to task about that. And that in itself is the law providing a tool or rather a stick within which you can apply some kind of uh, retribution or some kind of uh, consequences for people filing wrong documents. But I would say by and large, that would be the highest incident of what we see. People filing outrightly fraudulent or misleading documents when they know that those particular documents are not supported by any meeting or the deliberations as were held at the board meeting do not really reflect the extracts which have been filed at the company's registry. Um, in a large sense, and uh, as I come to close on this particular topic, you'd find that uh, sometimes personality clashes, internal wrangles, where you do not have people seeing in the same direction can really manifest itself in the way that a company is run, where you have quote unquote what are called factions within a particular company attempting to have their way more or less uh, reflected in the records of the company's registry. And uh, this becomes a bit of a concern because you do not sometimes as a company's registry understand exactly who is saying the truth and who is not saying the truth. And sometimes all you need to do is really push back to them and tell them to get their affairs in order. And if you do not understand exactly where they are progressively in terms of uh, uh, how they are lodging documents, you go back to a known position in fact about what the company's constitution was up and until uh, they get their act together. But ethics and uh, really integrity are what I would call the cornerstones that need to really be enforced to really remove some of the challenges that we are seeing on a day-to-day -day basis uh, at the company's registry. Malakai? I was saving uh, uh, this question to ask uh, Winnie last, after I've heard from you and, uh, and Prof. Uh, as, a, as, as a corporate governance uh, practitioner uh, and advisor, Winnie, uh, Professor did uh, raise the issue of individual governance, 
Mr. Gaduma has uh, raised issues to do with uh, ethics, integrity, accountability. Uh, what are some of the tools uh, you can talk about uh, that are being used at the board level to improve the quality of the practitioners themselves uh, within the boardroom? All right. Um... I think the, the issue of uh, I think the issue of legal disputes, maybe if I can go back to what um, Ken was was talking about, has really been um, uh, very thorny in, 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 in some of our enterprises and we've seen actually some giants succumb to to that just because of uh, uh, internal wrangles and legal disputes. However, when I look back at some of the cases, because over my over 20 years, I've, I've seen some very sad cases of uh, good businesses going down because of internal wrangles. You realize that the foundational issues were lacking. And as the businesses become bigger and as people become more grounded in their positions in the company, it becomes very difficult for them to now embrace good governance. And um, one of the things uh, I do see that helps is that even when a business is very small, is to start cultivating the right things from the word go. And some of the things that help to diffuse uh, these disputes that can, can really cripple an institution is really having good quality, well thought out governance documents. Because these documents actually speak to your spirit in terms of what you want to do. And uh, these documents would be documents like the primary one would always be the shareholders agreement, because this is the one that is bringing all the stakeholders together into that investment. And it will talk about how control issues should be managed or uh, how um, areas whereby these um, misunderstandings, how the process of going around that should, should be managed. And that normally I always say is the primary document that you cannot avoid. Uh, in an organization, and it's a pillar that you will stand on even in the future. And then you can go on ahead and ensure that any other uh, documents uh, uh, that are in place are actually understood by whoever is sitting in place and charged to the governance of the company. Those would be documents like um, the board charters, uh, the terms of references that are in place. And also there's an important document that was introduced by the new act, and then this was the appointment letter. And this letter is one that spells out exactly what your expectations of that role would be. And it becomes a document, a reference document that you use uh, when you're looking at um, the behavior of, of a director, especially when you're already running into headwinds with any of the directors that are in place. And you find that uh, in instances where these documents are in place, a lot of arbitration or mediation happens fairly quickly before a situation escalates. And these are some of the tools that I would say from a governance perspective are foundational documents that need to be part and parcel of uh, the board. Uh, as you are outlining the documents, uh, what came to my mind was uh, some of the some of the entities have these documents, but how do you measure whether you you are in compliance or you are employing best practice uh, in uh, compliance with your constitutive documents? Um, I think the, the 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 regulators, if I can speak to regulated businesses, have helped us a, a bit because uh, as practitioners. We, we would advise uh, companies to do what we would call a health check, a routine health check, to go around and see whether they are really, um, the procedures are speaking to the documents that are in place and the practices in place are actually in line and decision-making is actually in line with the documents that are in place. Um, what has happened when you, when you look at the way the regulators have helped to bring this point home is that they have introduced things such as governance audits and uh, the governance audit is now a statutory requirement for these kinds of entities. And it requires an independent auditor to come in, make an assessment and give an opinion. But basically what you end up having is that uh, the auditor would look at different areas of your governance and be able to give you an outline of what's working well, what's not working well and flag for you the high risk areas and the areas that need um, 
maybe shorter term or medium term kind of intervention. So the audits are really a good practice to be able to, to check whether you are really doing what you need to be doing or not. So that is uh, one of the things. But for the entities which are not regulated, uh, the advice would be that uh, it is good practice to bring on board things such as uh, health checks or audits, independent audits, just to give an assessment of how well you are doing on your governance. And immediately after outlining that, we go to the next question, which really speaks to the role of the company secretary. And uh, the question uh, which I would request to continue with, Winnie, before I move it to the other panelists, is uh, uh, in a bid to achieve good corporate governance, how has the role of the company secretary uh, in Kenyan companies evolved within the last decade? Uh, I think the company secretary has moved away from the back room, right into the center of the boardroom, if I can put it, if I can summarize it that way. Uh, uh, much earlier, even before the early part of the decade, I can say when I started my career as a company secretary, I even wondered whether I was doing the right thing because um, being a fresh graduate, having a lot of hope, I came in and I found I was doing a lot of returns and I asked myself whether that is what I should be doing on a daily basis because uh, the company secretary's role was so much limited to the administrative functions and the compliance functions, um, uh, more or less. But what we now have is that uh, the, the corporate governance space has completely changed. We have a lot of uh, uh, laws and regulations that have come out. There's a lot of, um, uh, I mean, there, there's a lot of um, emphasis on uh, fiduciary responsibility. Uh, the, the act has re requires that uh, the duties of directors are now codified. It's very clear to litigate against a director. So these, the, the, the directors now really need an expert to be able to work with them throughout this process. Number one, in terms of just ensuring that in terms of statutory responsibility, the company is well guided. But on top of that, you then find that in terms of board effectiveness, the role of the company secretary is now much amplified because you find that the company secretary is the person at the center of um, uh, uh, board effectiveness in terms of uh, things like board evaluations would be conducted by the board, uh, uh, board secretary. Things like uh, these documents we are talking about, the governance documents, the quality of them, the integrity of these documents. These are documents that would be managed by the company secretary. Uh, we are looking at um, uh, stakeholder engagement and in this stakeholder engagement, the primary person who is uh, engaged with the shareholders, with the regulators is really the company secretary and some of these areas become very technical areas. So you find that it is the, 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 the company secretary who has the skill set to be able to handle some of these things. And then of course, the area that I alluded to earlier, the area around uh, board uh, continuous development. Now the responsibility of ensuring that uh, the board is continually developing is now primarily on the shoulders of the company secretary. And you find that uh, it is the role of the company secretary to identify areas of training for the board members and to also round up where these trainings are happening and actually do ensure that the board is actually going through these processes. So the board, the, the role has completely changed from one which was uh, formerly very administrative to one which is very advisory in nature. Uh, I think it will not be, uh, your response will not be complete if I don't ask the service provider. To, 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 to give a few comments on how he has seen uh, the role of the company secretary change over the last decade or so. <laughs> Mr. Gadum. Yes, uh, the service provider is here to, to talk about his experience. Um, well, I, I do agree that uh, the, the role of the certified secretary, as they call themselves nowadays, has really changed uh, quite a bit from what they used to do Previously, it was mainly just filing of documents, uh, resolutions, and the like to ensure that uh, certain what I would call 
post uh, meeting uh, documentation is brought to the company's registry. That would have been what I would call mainly uh, administrative work as Winnie has talked about. But however, um, with regards to compliance, and uh, this is something that really uh, goes to the heart of what we do at BRS, we have made a market, what would call push towards companies, especially of course, uh, public companies, which are more or less by law required to have a certified secretary, to have a CPS before we have any conversation with them. Why do we do this? The need for the paradigm shift to things being done from an internal perspective to them being done from a compliance perspective really can only be uh, what I call, can only be amplified by as a professional. When we talk about uh, certain requirements of the Companies Act, and you're talking about uh, somebody who has been a director perennially since 1985 in a certain public company, then you lose some kind of line of communication there. And we are saying that the role of the company secretary, the certified secretary, goes a long way in putting a lot of what is required or expected of these companies from a governance perspective, being uh, so more or less uh, lodged in the company's registry. Indeed, uh, if you do not have the right kind of advice, you would find that uh, sometimes, and this is a live case I'm talking about, somebody wanted to have a name change done for certain compliance requirements. Uh, what advice they got from somebody who was not a certified secretary was to incorporate a new company. That in itself became a very convoluted issue because once a company is registered, even if you um, strike it off, there are a certain number of uh, what I would call years that require to lapse before you can use that name again. And as well, that being a live entity means that it would have been a competing entity to the one which really the customer wanted to use. Basically, instead of paying about 2,000, but they paid 10,750 for something very simple that could have been done in a day or so. And we are saying that, again, we have seen people come to the core, come to the fore to the company's registry and grapple with what needs to be done in terms of complying with linker business. When you talk about having to sit somebody through the administrative and uh, procedural requirements of the Companies Act, if it is to be done on a one-on-one -on -one basis, we'd we'll be here for a lifetime. It helps when you have somebody who has this knowledge in one basket and they're able to really take you through uh, the motions in a seamless, effective, and of course, compliant way, such that at the end of the day, we hold the company secretary uh, accountable for the documents that they lodge in the company's registry. And indeed, we've seen some kind of a shift with the responsibility that company secretaries and uh, certified secretaries accord themselves. They do know that if they lodge fraudulent documents or documents which are false within the company's registry, there are consequences. Even as simple as being administratively blacklisted for filing further documents or having what I'd call extra scrutiny on your documents because you are known to be somebody who is not truthful. In an essence, you end up really messing up your, your client base because you do not have the kind of trust that you are required to have within the ranks of your peers and your registry. So I'm saying in a nutshell, the role of a certified secretary is very critical. We actively encourage it at uh, the company's registry. We understand that compliance cannot be readily achieved if you do not have this professional in your ranks who is able to guide you on what you need to do. Uh, Malakai. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think we have almost exhausted uh, our time allocation for today, uh, but probably uh, to to give a uh, to ask for a concluding uh, remark uh, from Professor. Uh, professor, from the discussions we've had today, uh, in your view, uh, what is the future of corporate governance uh, framework and uh, practice uh, in Kenya? I think uh, such discussions are very good. Uh, they are good in the sense that uh, we begin to learn what is happening, what is not happening, how we can correct, uh, especially when you have the service provider there, 
and an experienced uh, uh, company operates uh, to correct some of the things. I think the direction we have gone through the annual training of, uh, of, 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 of directors is very, very important. We need to make the training a bit more sexier by getting new uh, experiences, new ideas, uh, because it's a manual exercise. And when you repeat the same, it becomes uh, sort of discouraging to go again. So we need, we need to continually begin to discuss. As I said, as we change, as the change comes, especially in the space of ICT, uh, we need to discuss in that space much more, share experiences from other companies. That's how we can improve the governance. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, I would like to request uh, Alan, uh, to uh, guide us through the uh, Q and A, if there are any uh, questions that have not have not been answered uh, during the discussion. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, the panelists and um, Malakai. I keep saying Malachi. I do not know why it came to Malachi, but it is Malakai. We shall repeat it. <laughs> I will ask two questions, and then thereafter we can have uh, the, the closing uh, comments from our DVC. Um, I have one from Maureen Gasheru, where she says she would love to hear from the panelists on the adoption of proposed changing of exported services from being zero rated to exempt and the possible effects. Well, that doesn't, that deals more with tax more than anything. Uh, Kahamed says that with respect to technology, big data and its application, in and within government organizational decision making, what should be the limits of its adoption, more so with respect to security or safety concerns? Um, and then the second question is from uh, Chris Oye. What measures would you propose for strengthening corporate governance around climate related compliance by companies? I think we can answer those two cumulatively and wind up. Uh could we request uh, Professor to handle the question on uh, big data and its application and security issues that comes with it? Yes, um, we are just at the beginning and uh, that's why the government itself came up with the data protection law. And uh, it doesn't stop, even, uh, even the GDPR does not stop use of data to enhance uh, corporate services, um, if it is done correctly. There are procedures uh, and there are guidelines. Uh, the law also provides for those who, who deal with the data. So it, it, there is nobody, there is no going forward in terms of uh, corporate governance without the data, because everything is going to be around that space. Uh, we are moving to an area where that every decision has to be based on uh, certain uh, numbers that guide, guide you. Uh, because what we are talking about, uh, predictability of certain behaviors, certain services um, have brought inclusivity. I'm saying this because we, are, we have already seen from the FinTechs, uh, we are, Every company is the business model is changing because of this uh, of big data. We are going to see many more business models come around. So we are not going to stop, but because government has created uh, uh, the data protection law, we must obey the law, and utilize that data to enhance uh, corporate decision Uh, could I request we need to uh, respond to the question on what measures would uh, uh, could be proposed for strengthening corporate governance around climate related compliance issues? All right, this is a this is a very broad question. Um, I was just turning it in my head. 
um, around how to go around it. Now, when you look at um, climate issues, you know there are, there are certain aspects around the climate that are very broad based, and you'll find that uh, when aspects are very broad based, there would always be general laws that are dealing with broad based issues. And uh, in our context, we do have a NEMA that is um, concerned about uh, generally what I would say anything touching on um, climatical issues or environmental issues uh, in the bigger perspective. And they do have processes on how that gets done. But now when you look at how do you then make companies do this, uh, some of these would have to narrow down to uh, sector-based and a lot of companies who are in, um, uh, who are doing uh, um, uh, operations that touch on environment uh, operate under license. And therefore they would be uh, compelled under the specific licenses that they operate under to do their businesses in a certain way. And they would be required through those licenses to be able to be audited or to be able to report certain compliance um, uh, requirements the way they need to be. They need to be done. Now, the best way to ensure that what needs to be happening needs to be happening normally comes through the process of transparency and accountability. And the, then that would then come out through the kind of reporting that these institutions would be required to make uh, disclosures over. So that uh, if there are uh, parameters that they need to report on and um, that they are meeting, then that becomes information that they do uh, disclose and are transparent about and the process on how they do give this information comes out. And again, this ties very closely to the aspects of the ECG when we were saying that when it comes to reporting, there will be certain parameters given to different sectors in terms of the areas that they would be required to, 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 um, to report on. So we will be seeing a bit of a change coming in this direction. I guess our change will start with the listed companies because they're the easier ones to loop into some form of laws and uh, get them to, 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 to do some level of reporting. But apart from that, then it becomes something which the licensee uh, of those particular operations would have to give as a condition in terms of what they want reported. Just to add a small thing on what, uh, uh, what my sister said, Winnie, uh, if you go to Silicon Valley, for example, companies are competing to say, me, I have used, I now use most solar uh, to produce Google or all the roofs in Google are um, solar. They contribute hugely to green energy. If we can begin in this country to say that my vehicles uh, meet the emission standards, uh, we can reduce a lot of diseases in this country uh, come because of vehicles spewing uh, into the air a lot of carbon dioxide. Uh, we can even begin from that level that uh, all my fleet has catalytic converters, the emission levels are very low. Then we move again to the level of energy uh, which is now beginning interaction in this country. Uh, that way slowly we can grow and begin to report on the EST. Uh, this is what I've seen with companies that have adopted ESD because we always confuse um, social, what do you call social responsibility? What do you call the other one? Uh, corporate social responsibility CSR. with ESD. <laughs> CSR with ESD. We actually need to go to ESD because that's where we are lagging. That is what we need to do. And that's why how we can help to remove opportunity, opportunistic diseases, especially around the mission, which are sending our children to hospitals. Thank you, thank you so much. Malakai, you can end the session for the panel. So we would like to take this opportunity to uh, thank all the panelists for, ma for making the time to attend and to engage and uh, 
ask questions. Uh, we do hope that this is not the end of the discussions uh, on good corporate governance. And as we continue, uh, we do hope we will continue engaging. So thank you everyone. And uh, I would uh, like to hand over back to Alan to take us to the next uh, session. Thank you, Malakai, Winnie, Professor Bitangendemo, Kenneth Gaduma for your time, for coming in to join us in this uh, summit and to share your experience and knowledge in this area. Um, over the last two days, we've really, yesterday and today, we've really learned quite a lot. Um, and also to just for purposes of um, posterity of this, of course, the videos have been saved on our YouTube page, so people can always go back uh, to learn from this, as someone said in the previous panel, um, we have gained advice that we have not paid for. So this is how you get free advice a lot uh, through these summits um, to get to learn and to grow. Uh, last but not least, I would like to invite um, our Deputy Vice Chancellor to give the closing remarks and to close the summit. Uh, this, unfortunately, the Chief Justice is presently holed up in a retreat. Uh, she called again the second time today to apologize. Um, she had said she would be available, but then the retreat is more um, came up, so she couldn't make it. Um, so in that regard, we requested our we requested our um, deputy vice chancellor to uh, give the closing remarks. Dr. Gashenga, the screen is yours. Um, thank you, thank you very much, Alan. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen and especially the who thankfully have managed to catch quite a bit of the discussions here and especially the Q&A. So first and foremost, greetings from our vice chancellor, um, Dr. Vincent Ogutu, who unfortunately also had another engagement. Actually, he was the one supposed to be doing these closing remarks because when I heard it was the chief justice, I thought unless I buy insoles, <laughs> those are very big shoes to fit in. But nevertheless, I'm sure you'll accept his greetings on, on I mean, his greetings from me. So, um, so generally my role was actually to first start by giving a big kudos to the organizers of this particular summit. Um, it's really been refreshing to hear some of the discussions and I'm sure we have made a great impact, not just amongst those who are panelists or those who are attending, but as Alan says, as the sessions are recorded, I, I'm sure they'll continue to help everyone. Now, um, Strathmore University, and here, okay, Strathmore Law School, sees these summits as very critical. Yeah? The, the opportunity to bring academia together with industry is, um, is one of those things that we have to keep doing. Some of you I know have many times heeded to our call whenever we've called you members of industry or even government officials to come and join us in this forum to engage across industry and academia, you have been very gracious to say yes. Yeah? So thank you very much for supporting that. They say academia and industry are joined at the head and to try and dis disjoin them ends up becoming a disservice to both parties. So, so actually I had made some reflections with respect to the, con and then with respect to the conversations that have gone on, I feel like I shall be preaching to the choir but nevertheless, I'll share with you some of the thoughts that came to mind when reading about this summit and the little I've heard of it. So I think all of us are agreeing that um, based on the reflections that we've made, I think technology is central. Yeah, and I think we all agree that within a very short time, technology has transformed society. And that also, of course, includes corporate law, like all other, dis all other disciplines. And I think among the things which we are noting is, um, you know, this whole issue of globalization. And globalization, I think, in a, in a legal um, context, and especially, I guess, in this context of corporate law, has, has implications. And I think we're going to begin to see lines between international and local corporations getting blurred. And, um, and I guess the temptation here can sometimes be to remain at the stage of nostalgia where you know, we sit down and we reflect on what the past has been like and probably even decry some of the things that may be happening presently. But I think more importantly, what is important is to take these um, changes that we're seeing in fora such as this to reflect on, to reflect and reimagine 
what is corporate law likely to look like in the context of the future of work? Now in Strathmore, we're really trying to do a lot of research in this area of the future of work, because as you can imagine, we have a responsibility to prepare graduates who will actually be in this space of the future of work. Yeah? So we want to make sure that the graduates from Strathmore are relevant yeah? and can actually contribute to society in that context. And not just in terms of employability, but also so that they can become innovators and entrepreneurial you know, persons and members of society so that they're actually in the middle of all that's happening and that they're actually contributing um, to the things that are happening in that space of the future of the work. So um, listening to you, I, I was thinking, I guess all of us were thinking with the fourth industrial revolution at the back of our minds. And I think, okay, before we had been saying we're on the brink of it, I, I feel like COVID may have tipped us into it. So we've gotten a taste of how life in the future may look like. And, um, and I guess that, that can already start telling us that you know, things are, there's going to be fast change. So it's important for us to, to start getting ready to deal with that. Now, how do we predict the future? I think Hamid asked a good question and I liked the response that was given by Professor Ndemo. And I suspect based on what he said, it's a conversation that had been going on that you know, data is critical. Yeah, and the role of big data, I think, um, is cutting across all disciplines. And um, sometimes we lawyers feel like we are <laughs> allergic to some of these issues of predictive data and the implications of analyzing it. But I think we are all in agreement that that will help us to predict how, how the world is going to look like. Yeah? How, how will this digitalization transform society? And how can we become players? Yeah? So, I don't know about you, but I think we're all feeling like there's a new scramble for Africa. Yeah? Um, we've seen yeah, that as markets shrink internationally, there's a more aggressive entry into our market, into the African market. And it's important for us not to fall into the passivity, which arguably may have been the situation in the last scramble for, for the African content, but rather to be prepared to you know, to be not just passive, but part of the change agents. You know? And he was thinking about it from the perspective of corporate law practitioners and, and even we academics. Yeah? So we keep asking ourselves, and I'm sure those of you in industry and in public or private practice um, have to constantly be asking ourselves, you know, are we really prepared from a corporate law perspective to embrace this change. Yeah. So in, in the event that um, localization in terms of law becomes redundant because of those bloodlines of you know, international and local co um, corporate practice, are, are we ready? Yeah, are we ready? Those of us in academics, we have to think, are we, are we preparing students for the future or might we be restricting them by focusing too much on what law is like in this particular, at this particular moment. Yeah? Um, and then for sure, even in this globalization and the blurring of international and local mm -hmm. practice, I'm sure there'll always be a niche yeah, for, for those, for even within the local space, there'll always be a niche for that space of corporate law practice. And I guess with fora like this is an opportunity for us to think, okay, um, now that we know that there's a niche, how, how do we carve that niche out, yeah, both for industry and also for those of us who are in academia, so as to make sure that um, we continue playing and playing a critical role, role in that space. Then, um, and therefore it's critical for us to partner, yeah? And, there, and, and we, we usually are very grateful when people like you, you know, take time off your busy schedules to join us in these reflections to enrich the reflections and actually share with us your experiences so that academia does not remain you know, outside, outside the scope of reality, which can sometimes happen with us thinking of big theoretical issues and perhaps being a bit out of touch with what exactly is happening on the ground. So, so thank you so much for always heeding our call when we've called upon you. Um, thank you for enriching what it is that we do in terms of academia. And then also to encourage you to share with us, you know, some of the challenges you've been discussing, share them with us because we feel, especially at the law school, 
when we give students research projects, we want to give them research pro projects that actually respond to the challenges of society. So, so please feel free to share with us some of those challenges so that we can also get our students to, to give feedback and you know, to, to make contributions in their own small ways. So, so just to thank you all, thank you in a particular way to Bowman's yeah, for partnering with Strathmore Law School in bringing this, um, this whole forum together. Of course, special thanks to all our partners, yeah, the, the more than 30 partners I think who have helped in one way or another. Of course, and a, a great gratitude to all the participants who've joined us virtually. And, um, and, the, and then those, I guess, who will be watching this streaming afterwards. So Asante Nisana, and um, back to you, Alan. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kashenga. Um, indeed, uh, you have captured the essence of um, what the summit has been about, to bring academia together with the practice and the practitioners, um, and to try find ways to create synergies between these two divides. Um, for the participants and for everyone else, it has been a good two days of being your MC. Um, this has been good. I was checking the views on YouTube and I'm seeing um, we have had a thousand views already. Uh, we had over close to a thousand people on yesterday morning, um, 500 people, 300 people. So we had a good number and we are sure that this has reached the masses. And of course, the videos are available on YouTube on the Strathmore University page, YouTube page, and you can be able to access them and rewatch and learn as much as you can from this, like I have, um, from the different panels. Um, initially, when we thought about this summit, um, we had only anticipated 200, 300 people, but we are glad that it has elicited the response it has. Uh, the attendance that it has, and also as mentioned by the DVC, um, our partners, the uh, partners in different law firms, the managing partners, the government officials that have joined us, um, that shows a great, um, a great aspect of synergy between uh, practice and academia. Um, on that said, I would like to hand it over to Ndegwa to give the final remarks and we shall close. Um, thank you very much, Alan. I think um, my heart is full. Um, when we started out, you know, planning for the summit, we really wanted to cover the full breadth of corporate law, um, corporate legal practice in Kenya over the last decade. And I think starting from the first panel of the managing partners of the top three firms and practitioners from all different um, firms operating in Nairobi, I mean, it's been an amazing journey for these two days. And I really can't wait for um, a bigger and better summit. So mine, I think, is really to convey um, the gratitude from the Bowman side to everyone who's joined us for this summit, both um, as either as a speaker, as a moderator, or the audience. And we really thank you. And please feel free to share the videos on YouTube to other um, people who are not able to attend. And I hope that this has made some form of has made some form of impact to anyone who attended. So thank you very much to everyone. And until next time, my name is Alex Ndegwa. Thanks. Thank you so much. Have a good evening.